Call to order the January 21st, 2020 Board of Commissioner meetings. Please silence cell phones, pages, and other electronic communication devices. Agendas are located at the back of the chambers. First, we have a moment of silent reflection for Commissioner Ron Rosconek's mother. Uh, Terry Rosconek will uh, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> First, we'll have a motion to review and approve the agenda. So move. Moved by Drews. Second. Second by DeSanto. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Next is the consent agenda by Ms. Holly. Five through 11. Good morning, Commissioners. Holly Hennies, Commission Office Manager. For public notice, the Board of Commissioners uses a consent agenda to act on non-controversial and routine items. The consent agenda is acted upon by one motion and vote of the Board. Items may be removed from the consent agenda and placed on the regular agenda at the request of a board member or a citizen. Today's consent agenda contains the following items. Approval of the minutes from the regular meeting of January 7th, 2020. Number six is to appoint Mr. Chair, Mr. Jerry Hershoff to the Pennington County Weed and Pass Board for a term of three years. Number seven is approval of the first quarter 2020 LEMPG, which is a local emergency management planning grant with the state of South Dakota. Number eight is approval of the chair's signature on the personnel action forms as submitted by emergency management. Number nine is to recognize and thank the volunteers for the month of December 2019. Number 10 is to authorize one Glock Model 19 duty weapon to be declared sur as surplus for the purpose of commendation as submitted by the Sheriff's Office. And finally, number 11 is to declare the list of L3 flashback units as presented as surplus for the purpose of resale, also submitted by the Sheriff's Office. Thank you, Ms. Holly. At this time, is there anyone from the public that would like to speak on number five through 11 or pull anything off the agenda? If not, is there any commissioners who'd like to pull any items five through 11 off the consent agenda today? Madam Chair. Commissioner DeSanto. I'd like to pull number six. Number six. Any others commissioners to be pulled off today? All right. Madam Chair, I would move uh, approval of five, seven, eight, nine, 10, and 11. Moved by Drews to approve the rest of the agenda besides number six. Do you have a second? Second. Second by Ross Connect. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Item six, Commissioner DeSanto, please. The uh, Pennington County Weed and Pest Boards decided to appoint Mr. Jerry Hershoff as our, uh, uh, for a term uh, for three years. And we'd like to have Jerry stand up and be recognized as our new member of the board. So thank you, Jerry, for stepping up. And uh, you, I think that you'll enjoy being on the board and uh, we'll get a lot done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Madam Chair. Commissioner LaCroix, please. Move for approval. Moved Sorry. by LaCroix on number six, second by Drews. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Next, we're on regular agenda items 12 through 16. First, we have the Black Hill Stock Show opening. Mr. Ron Jeffries. <clears throat> Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the Commission. Thank you for a few brief moments here to uh, invite everybody to the 2020 Black Hill Stock Show and Rodeo, officially kicking off January 31st down at the Rushmore Plaza Civic Center. Uh, I want to start by letting you know that we actually started with activities out at the fairgrounds last Friday. So these are all the events that we currently host or, or assist somebody else to produce that don't have time and space to fit into the regular week of the Black Hills Stock Show, so they just start two weeks early. But it certainly has been a nice run for the first part of the show. Uh, we're excited about what they bring to Rapid City. 
I wanted to recognize uh, John Kaiser back here for a minute. Um, I brought him over here and he had no idea I was going to do this. But um, one of the things, John, John and his maintenance crew have done an excellent job of preparing the James Kirstead Event Center to host this event, uh, the many different activities. When you get a chance and the public gets a chance to step into that building uh, this go around, it, it looks like an entirely new setup. It's just been, it's been painted and cleaned and uh, a lot of uh, new additions put in place. Uh, I think you'll be really impressed. And when the public gets down there, I wish they'd take a minute to thank John and, and our maintenance crew and the Department of Corrections volunteers for the, the fantastic thing, job they've done in putting that together. So John, thank you very much. I uh, wanted to also start with, um, there's been a few changes in the lineup for the stock show this year. Uh, John has taken on the responsibility for hosting all those horse events that take place two weeks earlier. So unlike uh, everybody else on the staff, John gets a four-week run of the Black Hills stock show uh, by hosting events. So it's a daily event that starts over there. He's got to be in there uh, before eight every day, and, and sometimes those events last till you know, nine or 11 o'clock at night. He's done a great job with that. Uh, with the kickoff on the 30, 31st official dates, I sent out an email which had the schedule for uh, director and commissioner appearances. There are a couple of items on there that do require RSVP. So if you look at that or if you're watching your email boxes, you'll see a couple of electronic invites that do require an RSVP. We're working with third party on those activities, so we need that. Uh, the first kickoff event that we have, of course, the uh, Black Hill Stock Show opens at 10 o'clock in the morning on Friday the 31st. And at 2 o'clock, we've got the official ribbon cutting for the start of the, of the uh, Black Hill Stock Show. Um, we did move the uh, Truck Defender Horse Sale in its entirety from the Civic Center. We always had the sale there in the preview at the James Kirstead. Uh, there was some... Um, uh, logistics issues with trying to go back up in the new construction at the Civic Center that we moved the horse sale in its entirety down to the James Kirstead Event Center. Uh, that should drive some traffic there, uh, which is a good thing, but it also left a hole back up at the uh, at the Rushmore Plaza Civic Center. And I'm going to fill in that hole in just a minute, but I want to keep you a little bit in chronological order. After our two o'clock ribbon cutting, um, we then have a program called Protect the Harvest. And it's a program that I hope you have time to take in because it's uh, a gentleman by the name of Dave Duquette that um, uh, started a program working on behalf of ranchers and farmers and uh, really stepping out to help educate the public about uh, the, all the good that comes from our agricultural community. We have so many different uh, entities attacking everything from uh, livestock flatulence to uh, uh, other types of products that, that for us uh, seems nonsensical, but for other parts of the, of the world, um, that, that does become an issue. And so he's working diligently to help educate the public. So we'd like you to attend that. I think there's also a private movie screening that comes up that Friday night at 6.30, which is one of the electronic invites that you received. Uh, that private movie screening is a program called, um, the, the movie's called The Stand at Paxton County, which is uh, inspired by true events about an incident that took place in Dickinson, North Dakota. And uh, we had the opportunity, we were <coughs> to, uh, um, through Dave Duquette, we ran into uh, a movie company and uh, uh, Forrest Lucas of Lucas Oil, who said, we've got this program where we'd like to have a private screening at the Black Hill Stock Show. It's our kind of clientele. We'd like to come out and, and do this screening. So it's, it's not quite the premiere release that you see where you've got the crossing uh, spotlights, but it is uh, a private screening of that movie. So um, we'd like to see as many people in attendance of that as, as possible, and that is a limited seating event. Going to the Rushmore Plaza Civic Center uh, on Saturday, Amanda Cameron in our office um, has been wanting to put a youth show. It was on one of her um, New Year's resolutions in uh, 2016 that I want to start a youth show. We're one of the major, the only major um, livestock show in the nation that did not have a youth division. And uh, this year with the moving of the horse sale, we were able to put the youth livestock show in place. Already, I think in the very first year, it'll be bigger than any single breed sale that we have throughout the show. So we're super excited about that. All of our uh, study and research indicates that if we want to build a new Civic Center arena and then fill it, we need to bring more people to town. And every piece of the research says the way to do that is through these youth activities. So we're excited about planning for the future. A uh, number of other activities. Uh, Saturday night, we have a, a wild ride, which is a bronc horse ride. Only the contestants wear costumes. Uh, I'm here to tell you, Deb, that the women are represented. We have two ladies that have entered the competition, so that's kind of exciting. Uh, we don't always get women entering the bronc ride, but it's an open forum, and so we're, we're kind of pumped about that. It's kind of cool. Um, we'll roll through the week with the uh, Hubbard Feed Supreme Row competition, which is the backbone. It's the reason this Black Hill Stock Show exists. And then we'll finish it up with a number of different things, ranch rodeo, uh, Bronx for breakfast, uh, 
artist quick draw competition. And uh, we expect to wrap everything up on uh, Friday, or Saturday, February 8th. We just want to extend the invitation for you to come and enjoy it and join us anytime you'd like and uh, invite the public to come out and enjoy one of Rapid City's largest events. So any questions or comments? Thank you, Ron. Um, number one, thank you for all you do and have done for our fairgrounds with our uh, staff there, um, the volunteers and the things that you make it very efficient with, Ron, they couldn't do it without you. So we appreciate everything you do as a board and uh, as a community. And I'll keep saying the uh, economic impact that that fairgrounds makes for Rapid City and the surrounding area is amazing. And that's because of you and your um, employees and your uh, board that make that happen. We couldn't do that without you. Um, you represent Pennington County in a very positive way in the ag and just as a community member, because we don't just do um, rural uh, participation at the fairgrounds. We do about everything with fire, volunteer fire departments. And I've seen a race car, little um, race car <laughs> events Bill there. Sports and Club, yep. Yeah. So it, it's pretty cool how you made the, uh, the fairgrounds in the middle of Rapid City part of its community. Um, by all the events that we show there. And then um, being a commissioner that knew not much about rural and then joining Pennington County, it's been amazing. And I've learned 80%, uh, 90% of that about rural communities through the fairgrounds. So thank you for all your folks do. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, commissioner Roskinick. Uh, Ron, uh, thanks again for another outstanding program. Uh, you just uh, seem each year you do better than the year before. And Really appreciate your hard work and your staff's hard work. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair. Commissioner LaCroix. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ron, I think yourself and your staff are doing an outstanding job and and you got one of the most involved boards that, I, that I've ever seen and they do an excellent job of diagnosing what's going on, what things to look forward to and planning for the future. and. The only question I'd have is if you could give a brief update on the on the stalling bar where where that's at the new sure. stalling bar. Sure. So the stalling the new stalling building will not be available for this uh, for this stock show, but it will be by next year's. It'll be available this spring. Uh, the foundation's in. The dirt work around the building is in. They're making the attachment to barn eight, uh, making those adjustments right now. Uh, I imagine that as soon as the stock show is over, we'll see the vertical start going up. So uh, it's coming along nicely. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Lloyd. Commissioner DeSanto. I know uh, Ron and his team are gonna do a great job this year and I drove by the office, I believe it was Sunday afternoon and the parking lot was full and it looked like you were having a meeting there at, I don't know, four o'clock in the afternoon. So they're putting in their overtime to uh, make this stock show come out good and, and uh, great for everybody in the in the community. So it'll be a good event. Good job, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Commissioner Drews. Ron, again, my appreciation. John, thank you for what you do. Uh, you put in a lot of hard days here and appreciate it. And I know there's many hard days to come here also. But uh, no, you guys do a great job. Thank you much. Thank, thank you. you. Look forward to seeing you at the Black Hill Stock Show. Thanks, Ron. And much you, Sarah, from your board is here today. And Black Hills Energy has done um, above and beyond for our fairgrounds. And we appreciate everything they've done as well in our sponsors. But John Kaiser, I um, had the pleasure to work with you on many projects. And if you want something done, uh, you call John Kaiser and Ron Jeffries and they'll get it done for you. So good job, guys. Thank you. Number 13 would be items from the auditor, Miss Cindy. We kept it talking to about 9.15 for you, Miss Cindy. <laughs> good timing. Good morning, Commissioner. Cindy Muller, Pennington County Auditor. Um, we already have the first budget supplement of 2020. These are restricted funds um, for the John T. Vukovich budget. And you'll notice that the amount that was originally in your motion it was a little more than what we're ending up um, being able to supplement. And that was because they had just a few more 2019 invoices that they needed to pay. So the amount they're asking to supplement is $7,671.79. Thank you, Miss Cindy. Do you have a motion or so, discussion? So moved. Second. Moved by LaCroix, second by DeSanto. Any discussion? <coughs> All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Bless Thank you, sister. Number 14 is items from equalization. Shannon Ritberger. 
That's a pretty tie. Thank you. <laughs> the the abatements that we have uh, today are just more of the same stuff uh, I, I've told you before. At this time of year, we we hold these over uh, till after tax bills are printed. It's more of the same stuff. If you get a question, I'll answer it. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll we'll have more for the next meeting or two. Same kind of stuff. Thank you, Shannon. Do we need? Do we have any questions on one through seven, or board? Would you like to take them all at once as a, an approval, or separate? I'd prefer all at once. Say all. Yeah. So we will I'd do. Make, I'd make that motion. We'll do approval one through seven, um, Commissioner Decroy, yep. and second by. Drews, and then we have a question by Commissioner Roskinet. And Commissioner Okay. Uh, Shannon, there's seven of these abatements, and I think five are related to owner occupancy issues. So when we do the new uh, assessment notices in March, do you think that'll help uh, reduce some of these in the future? Yeah, I hope so. Uh, the, these are, there, there's a mix of the owner occupied here. Uh, we, we set up an automatic process to automate it as much as possible when, when somebody buys a new property uh, to continue the owner-occupied classification. Uh, there's one in here, at least one, where we get an odd deed. Uh, somebody, uh, Shannon, deeds a property to Shannon. That screws up our automatic process. Um, and, and so there's something like that. We also find holes in our automatic process. We're currently dealing with that right now. This is how we fix it. Um, some of them take place after the assessment notice. Um, that's difficult. Uh, but if people watch their assessment notice, we could eliminate a lot of this stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner DeSanto. Shannon, the only one I had a question on was 14A6. What property is that that's exempt from taxes? What number on the? Wh which one are you looking at? 14A6. The Penta what, County. What number is that on the one through seven? 2276 or uh, the Penta one County. One through seven, it would be. Okay, number Penta six. County. Number six. I don't know. Uh, short answer is I don't know. I do remember there was one uh, that was acquired out on Sheridan Lake Road, and this is probably it, but I can't say for certain. Okay. Uh, very small tract of land. Um, and we acquired it? Yeah. Okay. I, I think uh, I'm pretty sure it had to do with uh, road right away when they're widening. If that's it, for the that's Sheridan what Lake, it is. Lake Road project. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Shannon. Any other questions? <clears throat> Not do we have a we have a motion by Lacroix, second by Drews. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you, Shannon. Thank you, Shannon. Items from Highway. Superintendent Joe Miller. Good morning, Commission. You guys are throwing us all for a loop, rearranging yourselves. <laughs> At least me, anyways. Um, Joe Miller of Penn County Highway. Uh, first up, we have uh, continuance from the last meeting. Sonquist Lane Bridge. Uh, I hope that we attached all the things that was asked for at the last meeting. Um, we attached to the comparison of the different styles of bridges. Um, our engineer, I just want to touch on that a little bit. You know, we've got the 164th bridge that's in everybody's mind. Um, and there are some things on 164th bridge that we didn't have to do just because of the situation. Um, it was an emergency, so we didn't have to do a hydraulic study. We didn't do... Um, a number of different things you know we didn't have to do the erosion control uh, we didn't pay for the traffic control we didn't have to pay for putting a bypass in um, the graveling was done by the county the permanent signs so it, he uh, bill broke down the uh, proposal from bros engineering for the modular construction and it come down come to about two hundred and five thousand dollars if you take out all the stuff that we didn't have to do on the 164th bridge. So that's kind of where some of that cost is coming uh, coming into comparison there. I guess with that, I'll uh, stand for any questions. Questions? Commission? Or motion? I'll make a motion to authorize the highway superintendent to sign the work order proposal for professional services with Bronze Engineering Inc. design and plan preparation for replacement of bridge 52305 300 on Sonquist Lane 
which will include not to exceed the fee of 49425 Motion by Roskinen. Second. Second. Second by Drews. Any other discussion? Not. Um, motion carries. Thank you for doing all that uh, comparison. That made a huge difference of making it easy Absolutely. for us on, on which way we should go. Thank You're you. welcome. Item B. Do you want to vote on that? Got to vote on it. Oh, I thought we did. No. You got the motion in the second. You didn't vote on it. Oh, I thought I said all in favor. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries. Thank okay. you. Okay. Next up on your agenda is a uh, motor grader purchase. Uh, this is in line with our equipment purchase plan that we had uh, brought to you guys last year. Um, we have met with RDO and CAT and, and just gave them a heads up as to what's coming down the pipeline. Um, you know, just some numbers from last year. Uh, you know, quote from in 2009, we... The quote was $315,000. They gave us $100,000 for trade-in, um, and we ended up spending about $215,000. This year, we'll be trading in two of the older, oldest machines, uh, 2009, which has 6,700 hours, um, and a 2011, which has uh, 6,200 hours. Um, with that, I guess I'll stand for any questions. Questions, board? Madam Chair. Commissioner LaCroix. Joe. <clears throat> I remember we had some big discussions on this last year, and, I, and I'm, I just wanted to express my appreciation for the hard work that you guys did last year as far as uh, getting employees out, trying out different vehicles or motor graders and, and the process. I think that really helped as far as us as a commission maker. And then you also did a layout plan for replacement. and. You're following that, so I just want to say I appreciate that work that you do. Thank you. Yeah, it was a lot of hard work, but I think it was it was worth it in the end. Yeah. Thank you, Lloyd. Um, Commissioner Drews. Jill, remind me. Do we have a, do we have a, one of these that's basically as uh, extra in case of a major breakdown on no. one of the existing ones? So we don't. No. So if you have a breakdown, you go fix it. Correct. Okay. And we made a decision this this year. We're going to move. Are we have four blades in wall? Um, all of their the 2009 is in wall, um, and the 2000 or no, excuse me, the 2009 is in Rapid City, and the 2011 is in wall. Um, we've made a decision. We've got two, two 2016s in New Underwood, <coughs> and wall will be getting these two brand new blades. So basically, everything in wall is under warranty. Um, so if we have to pay for a service call or, or if something does major breakdown, we're not paying for road time or drive time. It's all under warranty. So good idea. Yep, Madam, good idea. Madam Chair, just to follow up to Gary's question, I, do, I believe we do have a contract if something does go down with one of our graders that we could get a backup. With RDO currently, they will give us a loaner Yeah. Um, if, if it is under warranty. Okay. Um, and it, they've helped us out in the past. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any more discussion or motion, please? Motion to approve. Motion by Rosconnect. Second. Second by LaCroix. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. All right. Uh, next on your agenda is a joint powers financial maintenance agreement with the state. Um, this project is to put rumble strips like you have alongside the interstate um, on a couple of, you know, three of our, our roads. Nemo Road, Norris Peak, and South Canyon. Um, we asked them, you know, we thought the normal rumble strip is eight inches wide. And with the narrow nature of our roads, we thought, well, that's probably too wide. You're going to be on the rumble strip before you're even on the fog line. So we asked them if there was a different width uh, rumble strip that they could put in. And they did come back. They can put a six-inch rumble strip in um, instead of that eight-inch. So hope, we're hoping that uh, the fog line, it'll be outside the fog line. Um, some couple ADTs. Nemo Road has an average daily count of 2,041. Norris Peak has 606. Uh, South Canyon, which is the uh, Nemo Road closer to town, uh, 4,037. And then some crash history on the on those roads uh, from 2016 to 2019 on Norris Peak. There were 14 accidents. Mark, when was the reconstruction? When was the reconstruction? So in 2017, it took out two 90-degree curves. So that's probably why that crash history isn't as high on the on Norris Peak. And then South Canyon Road, uh, there's 23 total accidents. So um, this is a fully funded state project. So there's no monies coming out of our budget for this. 
Thank you. Questions? Commissioner DeSanto. Um, I'm just curious as to <clears throat> what determines whether or not they put those rumble strips. Because like Norris Peak Road, is there a speed where they put the rumble strip, a certain speed limit where they put the rumble strips? Or, I mean, aren't rumble strips for falling asleep at the wheel or drifting off the road because you're not paying attention, that type of thing? It's to help try and eliminate road departure crashes. Well, yeah. Um, you know, they the state has kind of, it's... <coughs> excuse me. Bless you. Um, they have different thresholds, minimum ADT of 1,000 average daily count. Um, and they, they go off the crash history. I don't know for sure what they're, you know, they're trying this on a number of different roads in my, uh, from my information, I, I believe from my memory, um, throughout the Black Hills. Hmm. Just seems like on Norris Peak, most of those crashes, I would assume, is because people were going too fast <coughs> on those corners and went off the road and the rumble strip's not going to help that. And they, uh, you know, it, I just picture rumble strips being for you're driving and you get tired or you're driving and texting like you're not supposed to and you run off the road but uh nor speak this seems an odd place to have rumble strips but but hey, and, the state wants it I, and i you just hit the nail on the head i think it's a lot of it's you know distracted driving right you know it's going to get their attention that they're getting close to the edge and be able to correct it until they drop before they drop a tire over the edge of the road and they're not able to recover <laughs> okay commissioner ross connect uh jill so does north speak road uh their uh, average daily traffic is over a thousand vehicles a day. 600. It's 606, but that's why I kind of pointed out the crash history. They go off the average daily count or the crash history. Okay. Um, yeah, they get that one hill. I used to live on North Peak Road, so uh, there's some there's one hill that's pretty challenging. It's it's a lot better than it was, but you still got to be paying attention. Yes, absolutely. I'll be interested to see what the traffic or what the uh, accident rate is. Two years from now, after they put the rumble strips. In. Yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to yeah. see. <laughs> Any other? <coughs> Girls might be better. Any other discussion? Okay. Move if, for approval. Move by Lacroix. Second. Second by Desanto. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries. Item D. Oh, item D. Utility uh, relocation agreement. So last meeting, the utility certification came to you uh, for Sharon Lake Road. This is a agreement that we've entered into with, or we would like to enter into, I guess, um, with Black Hills Cooperative. Um, one thing I want to point out is the, the South Dakota codified law that we cited in the memo is not correct. Um, it should just be 26-23 uh, instead of the 23.1. Uh, as Jay kindly pointed out, that 23.1 is referring to specifically the DOT, which we did not catch. So I um, just want to point that out. Um, with this, this is uh, approximately 50% of the lines are outside of the right of way, which is the ones we're paying for because we're moving our road onto their um, utility lines and 50% of them are currently in the right of way, which is the ones Black Hills Cooperative are paying for. Dollar amount on this agreement is $98,000 and it's accounted for in our 2020 budget. Um, with that, I'll stand for any questions. Questions? I'd move for approval. Second. Moved by DeSanto, second by Rosconnect. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries. Okay, so with this one, uh, this is a right-of-way certification for Sheridan Lake Road. Um, currently, we do not actually have the green light from the state to get the signature on it, but they requested that we bring it here for your guys' approval and sign it at a later date. If that's something you guys are okay with, we can proceed, if not, we would probably we would likely need to set a special meeting for next week to get this done before the end of the month to get it to bid letting authorization. So can you give a, us a brief explanation of what that means? Basically, we're certifying that all of the right of way has been obtained um, and is correct. We received a number of comments back from the state on Thursday afternoon. Um, or what, Thursday afternoon or Friday. Uh, we came in yesterday, worked on those. State was not working yesterday, so we sent those back to him, all, made all the corrections um, on those and sent it back to the state. I asked for a phone call from him this morning. I have not received that, um, so we don't know if we got the green light or not. He's in the process of reviewing it. Um, basically, uh, this is us certifying that the right-of-way is correct and done. So 
So we have Motion. all the right. So we have all the right of ways done on Sheridan Lake. Correct. Is what we're saying, except for the Forest Service. Motion to approve. Thank you. Second. Motion by Ross Connect. Second by Lacroix. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed. Motion carries. Item F. And this is the bid letting authorization for Sheridan Lake Road. Um, the advertising will be February 21st with a bid letting date of March 18th. Um, just some numbers here, I guess, for you guys. Um, so the total project cost, um, their latest estimate is for construction cost, um, it's $25.6 million. Um, currently we have $7 million allocated for this in our reserves. Um, our STP fund account balance with the state match of 18.05% is $6.3 million. And then we are taking out a 10 year SIB loan on those STP funds that we get every year, which equals about $8.5 million. Uh, both of those added together is about $22 million. So I just want you to keep in mind, the $25.6 million is just an estimate. We don't know what it's going to, what the final costs are gonna be until we open the bids. Um, so we do have about 4 million left in reserves after all of our projects are done. Um, South Rochford, uh, Deadwood Avenue, 1416, um, the bridge, um, all of those projects, if they were to be completed, we had about 4 million left in our reserves. So we will be able to cover the, the remaining balance on that if necessary, if the costs come in to be that high. So you have 3.6 left in your reserves. You're guessing around, guesstimate is 22 million, and you do have the 3.6, like I said, to make the 25.6 in case it's... Correct. Okay. Madam Chair. Commissioner DeSanto. Just a little synopsis, I guess, of how these estimates have come in since this project started. Uh, when it started, the original estimate was $11 million. If you don't remember correctly, that's eleven million dollars, and then it went to fifteen, and now we're up to twenty-two, and I just—that's a huge difference over a very, very short period of time, and it's difficult to understand where such a massive—I mean, that's a eleven million dollar dif difference in uh, in the estimate. So it's hard for me to understand where this, where that gigantic gap was filled. Um, maybe you can expand on that a little bit. You weren't here when it first started. I understand that, Joe, and I think you're doing a great job and you're uh, paying attention to everything, but $11 million, that's huge. Well, I think a big portion of it, you know, this project was started 12 years ago, or 11, 12. So, <laughs> um, so three, you know, if you, consider 3% inflation a year. That's, that's a big tr portion of it. Um, compounded. What's that? Compounded. Correct. As Ross connect said. So that's, that's a big portion of it. And then bid climate. Um, you know, there's a lot of projects out of there, out there right now. We've got a lot of contract, you know, a lot of projects and, and not a, so many contractors. So, um, I think that's another big portion of it. Supply and demand. Correct. Um, you know, and again, these are just cost estimates from the state and, you know, Ferber. Um, Ferber's still estimating that $20, $22 million. So um, this is the state estimate of that 25.6. So theirs went from 18.5 two months ago to 25.6 now. Um, so they're, I think they're trying to, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, but they're trying to compensate to make sure we, we do have enough funding. You know, you always want to overestimate. Right. So I think that's where a lot of it comes in. Um, with the bid climate, we don't know what we're going to get. We're hopeful that it'll come in much, much under that 25.6. I think that this exemplifies um, something that I say quite often, the difference between wants and needs and, and our duty as commissioners to really pay attention because we get a need. Sheridan Lake Road is a need, and uh, and this and this comes in, and we wind up with twenty two million dollars that we've got to spend, and we might have spent money in other areas where we didn't need to spend. As we got, to, that's something we really need to. 
focus on is not authorizing projects that are not that are wants and not needs. So, just my opinion, Madam Chair. Mr. Lacroix. I appreciate Mark's view on this. Where I where I get frustrated with it, and he's absolutely right, is is things move. It's part of the process, the government process that takes so long that it, all of a sudden the cost goes up. You know, when we had to do the acquisitions, the right of way is getting uh, planning, uh, environmental uh, studies done, and pretty soon, you know, the best way I'd explain it is the fair board <coughs> with the stall board, you know. Listen to many of those guys in that board meeting sitting back going, I can get things done this cheaper, but they don't have to go through the steps that the government has to or we have to to get that done. And that alone increases the cost for what we have to do. And it's, it's unfortunate. I wish we could just make a decision, bam, let's get started and get going on that day. We could save some money that way. But the process is uh, with the public hearings and and environmental studies and engineering and all that, that adds the considerable cost what we need to do for our community. Yeah, and I think I, I've figured it out in the last three years, you get three government entities involved and they move about the third in the paces if you only had one. So um, that's it's definitely a, an eye opener for myself and, and I think we're on the right track to get both these large projects off the ground this year, so. I'll test to that to a two hour meeting the other day on 166,000. So um, our our highway department does a wonderful job with Mark and, and Joe. And if you want to see two people that fight for um, what needs to be done in the county and uh, tries to get those costs down, you got two guys there that uh, they don't give up. So we've got our way in some things and others uh, not yet. <laughs> We're still fighting, or fighting, debating. Uh, Commissioner Roskinek. Madam Chair, uh, Joe, I would venture to say that if we waited another 12 years, um, Sharon Lake Road, same design, same build, probably be over 80,000 or 80 million. I, so I would. Time is money, and so I'm glad that this thing's moving along because if we waited another year, it'd be, it'd be uh, probably looking at two or three million a year. So I appreciate you keeping this thing going. Yes. Any You're other welcome. discussion or motion? Move for approval. Moved by LaCroix. Second. Second by Drews. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries. Thank you, uh, Superintendent. Chair. I would like to point out one more thing. Uh, I appreciate, Joe, you guys acquired properties faster than I ever imagined you guys being able to acquire properties. <clears throat> I thought that that particular part of the project was going to take much longer than it did. So I appreciate you guys' effectiveness in, in negotiating what we needed to get done as far as the properties were concerned. And I want to I want to pass that on. I'll pass that on to Ferber. They did much of the, the negotiations and the, the right-of-way acquisitions. We were highly involved, obviously, but uh, Andy Jackson, uh, who worked for Ferber, um, and myself, Mark, and Adam Krogman, the engineer on the project, all worked in conjunction to get this thing done. Um, Andy is very, very good at what he does. And if he had a question, he came to us and that's where, where we're at. Much of the, the thanks and appreciation needs to go to Ferber. They did a lot Pass of it, it on from me. Absolutely. You guys did a great job as far as that's concerned. Mr. Ross Connect, did you have? Oh no, okay. I was just gonna make sure that we recognize Ferber because uh, after a few meetings, I've, I know a lot more about this and, and uh, they were definitely a part of the team. and. And uh, they just didn't quit. They just said, we got to do it until we're done. And they finished it. Thank you. And a uh, point of privilege, um, we did have Joe, me, and Ron come with us to the wing nets. And it was a very good conversation. And Joe um, answered questions very professionally. Um, and we appreciated you coming just to help the public with an understanding of roads and bridges. And um, the people there, I think, uh, understood a little bit more on some of the issues that we have in Pennington County, but there was very good questions from people and uh, we appreciated you being there with us. So absolutely. Thank I you, Joe. Very liked going. Thank you. Thank you. Item 16 is Mr. Cody Shad construction permit and mining permit. Uh, Cody, we are going to have you do your presentation first and then the public. Um, I'm sorry. 
we'll have our planning department do their presentation, then Cody, and then we'll have the public come up and speak. If you'd like to speak on this item, please fill out a speaker request form um, so we have your names and give it to Miss Holly to the right of the dais. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Cody Sack, environmental planner. Uh, so item 16 is uh, permits on the mining permit 1903 and construction permit 1918 for Cody Shad. Um, Mr. Shad came into the planning department back in October talking about wanting to do a project on uh, the subject property on the end of Marvin Road. As you see on the screen, this is the subject property. Um, through conversations with staff, he was um, referring to having to remove some gypsum from the site. Um, and if you, in our ordinance under 507B, which is the mining permit, uh, it states that no extraction of any mineral or substance exceeding 100 cubic yards from the earth shall be conducted without a mining permit issued by the commission. He was going to go over that 100 cubic yards, so we as the planning department um, informed him that he would have to apply for a mining permit as well. Um, so on November 1st, he applied for that mining permit along with the construction permit. Uh, the construction permit was heard on November 25th before the planning commission um, for public comment. Uh, Construction permits are approved by the planning director. So we just, um, as part of our MS4 permit, we have we put them out in the public for public comment. Um, there was no public comment. Um, Commissioner Coleman did ask um, what was to be done with the gypsum, and we did inform the planning commission that it was going to be hauled off site by GCC Dakota. Uh, they didn't have any further questions after that. And then on December 2nd, um, 2019, mining permit 1903 was heard before the planning commission. It was on the consent agenda and it was approved unanimously seven to zero. There were no comments or concerns voiced by the public at that time. Uh, staff has been out several times to the site on December 13th, 27th, December 27th, 2019, January 7th, 2020, January 13th, 2020, January 14th, 2020, and on Friday, January 17th. Um, from comments made by um, the neighbors at some uh, one planning commission meeting and several board of commissioners meetings. So staff did go out to check those complaints. Uh, from what staff can tell, these are rough estimates of the disturbance. Um, what you see in red is what staff has calculated as disturbed. It could be more. Um, you'd see the big area down here is about five acres or four and a half, five acres, and down here is about an acre. This is Marvin Road. One concern was hauling down the road. Um, so just wanted to show the Board of Commissioners the road, um, what we're dealing with here. This is the site, this is the gypsum that's gonna be hauled off site. Um, this was taken on the 14th of January. He does have berms. Um, these are big 10, 15 foot high berms that separate his property from the neighbor's property. Um, so unless you're standing up on the hill of a adjacent property, you can't really see the site. Um, I saw no evidence of runoff, storm water runoff. I, it is December, but there's no storm water runoff. And there was no signs of any material being on a neighbor's property. That was one concern that was voiced at the planning commission meeting last week, that there were piles of material on other people's property. I walked the property line, the entire property line of the disturbance. I saw none um, of that. Uh, he does have an upper area of work, too, that he's wor working on where he's going to be building a shop. Um, this would be that picture here. Um, even up here, there was no signs of any sort of erosion or sediment runoff, none on the neighbor's property either. Um, as you can see, he's got a trench dug here for in the spring when water does run off to catch that and bring it back onto the property. Um, this is looking down the neighbor's property line. As you can see, there's a good two foot gap between the disturbance and the neighbor's property. And that was it. And then I was out there on Friday when the winds were really blown. It was about 25, 30 mile an hour winds and I saw no evidence of dust. I do have videos if you would like to see those. Would you like to see the videos? Yeah. Sure. Cody, 
Wait, is this the gate entering the property? Yes, this is the entrance, and then I can show you another one that actually shows the whole property. Um, if you'd like, if I don't know how long you want to watch these videos, they're about a minute apiece. Go off to the right of what we're seeing here, Cody. Is that where that Smith property is? Uh, yeah, I don't think it's the Smiths. I don't know. They're one over. This is the neighboring property right here. Um, that'd be the closest neighbor to him. The Smiths who showed the video, they sit one okay. property over. Okay. Cody, what's the setback if you have mining? I don't believe there is one in 507B. I think one thing to keep in mind is obviously the folks out there have pictures of a lot of red dirt all over there. Um, now that the ground is frozen, we had quite a long spell of very cold weather and, uh, and high moisture actually as well. Uh, that's going to definitely solidify what sediment is out there. So there's a very good likelihood we're not going to see any more dust blown around until May or June even um, would, would be my guess. But to say that that dust wasn't blowing prior to winter setting in and uh, the copious amounts of moisture that we got and then a long cold spell, um, the, they, I'm sure that they were experiencing dust blow um, prior to December. Yeah, and that's correct. And then one thing to note too is their road. Um, was kicking up a lot of dust when I was actually on it. I was looking at the road, driving down the road. It kicks up a lot of dust on Marvin Road. And the road, just in general, even in front of me when I stopped, was kicking up dust as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not saying it's the road that's causing the dust problem, but... It's not healthy. It, sure. The site wasn't, but the road was correct. when I was out there. So I just had <clears throat> a couple questions for Cody. Um, Cody, you made the comment that... Uh, of the public hearings, how are those notified for the, for what what the mining? Um, unfortunately, under 507B, since 320 got thrown out, it doesn't require notification, and neither does a construction permit. Um, so the neighbors wouldn't have necessarily been notified. However, we did have a conversation before with one of the neighbors that did tell them that there was a meeting for him having a construction permit the week before. So the next Monday would have been the planning commission meeting. So there was a neighbor who was notified. Okay. Um, neighbor was that? Mark Wiley. Wiley. Okay, okay. So I, I, I just wanted to clarify, you know, on your conditional use permits and stuff like that, you have a sign to put up. Mm -hmm. There was a way to notify him, but if there wasn't nothing sent out or nothing mailed, then no, because we have, um, according to Mr. Shaw, the applicant, he's not selling the gypsum. It's just being hauled off site. If he were to sell it, it would have required a conditional use permit. But since he's not selling it, it didn't require a conditional use permit. Second question. Um, with this mining permit, it was for six months, correct? Correct. There, um, through review, when I was reviewing the um, uh his conditions, conditions, it was approved with seven conditions, condition like five or six. Five says that he has to terminate hauling in six months from approval. Okay. Which would put it May or June. Okay. I just, I just wanted to clarify some of that too. And, and the reason why he was, the mining permit was re required because he needed to remove a bunch of that material in order to do the work that he did. And so he had to do a mining to get rid of it, and whether he sells it or not, he would have to remove it. Yeah, the yep, and the planning department is the one who told him that he needed the <coughs> mining permit. He didn't come seek the mining permit. We told him, as since he met the definition, he was required to get the mining permit. Okay, that's that's all the questions I had. Thank you, Mr. Roskett. Uh, Cody, when someone comes into your office and they want to build a home. Mm -hmm. They have to give you detailed blueprints, uh, type of construction. I assume they want to know when it's going to be done. And so this here, I see somebody going up there with some equipment. But did they tell you that 
um, give you any kind of a scope of the project. Like this is what we're going to do. This is how big it's going to be. This is what it's going to. This is going to be the impact. Do we got all that information? Yep. Did the neighbors have that information? Um, they just requested the permit. They didn't request everything that was submitted with the application. They just requested the mining permit and the construction permit. And since um, on there we're very literal on what you request is what you get. Um, but on the application, it does say how much he's going to disturb, which I believe, if I remember correctly, his permit covers 20 acres. And he's only done about, I would say, at the most, 8 to 10. So this, the size would be roughly 20 acres? It could be, yes. And we've talked to the applicant about getting this lower, air, getting the top site shored up um, with the erosion stuff and make sure that nothing, no dust or anything is leaving the site and to finish down here before he moves on to here and moves on to other sites so it's not just 20 acres of open land um, and he was willing to do that. Um, also, he was talking, um, he does have a water truck on site now or water tank on site for the dust control. That was a request from the planning department and he did, when I was out there on one of my site visits, he did have that out there. And how, and how many gallon is that truck? I don't know. That'd be a question for him. Okay. Um, and where he, does the truck get the water? That'd be a question for I'd him. I'd just be curious if that truck as, as well actually too. operates. Mm -hmm. um, but he did say that any new disturbance, he hasn't worked um, for a couple weeks now is what he was telling us. Um, but any new disturbance that he would spray it with water because it is like Mr. Um, <coughs> Mr. DeSanto said, winter time, so that will freeze. Um, and, uh, and I don't want to stand up here and say that even on Friday there was no dust leaving the site when I was there and observing it. There was no dust leaving the site. I can't say for I, Staff would never say for certain that no dust ever left. The <coughs> only other concern is that you went out there, the, or our planning and zoning went out there December the 13th, December the 27th, January the 7th, January the 13th, January, or January the 14th, and <coughs> January the 17th. And I, I wonder... That just seems an awful lot to me. It seems like we shouldn't have to be going out there uh, spending that much time on this project. I think we got other stuff that we'd yeah. be better off spending time on. All, um, usually what happens with those site inspections is usually I go out to a site once a month or once every couple weeks. Um, but pretty much all of those when I went out there were after a meeting, a board meeting, or where the public came and voiced concerns for us to go out and verify it to see if those concerns were we could verify those concerns or to see what we can do to mitigate those. So those are all after a public complaint. So I have. So you had five complaints since December 27th. How many of those complaints did you find legitimate? I, the, the dust complaint, I, I don't want to necessarily speak on because I can't. Unless there's a video from the public or somebody showing that there's dust, I can't for sure say. Just when I was out there, I didn't observe anything. But when I was out there and observed, I didn't see anything. So all those were dust complaints? Um, some of all the ones that, um, one was a dust, well, some of them, most of them were dust complaints. Um, some of them were hauling on the road, which we can't, we don't have any, we don't have authority over the road. So we can't say anything with that. And then. The other complaints were that there was um, sediment getting onto somebody's site. Somebody said that there was a pile of gypsum on their property at the planning commission meeting, but I didn't see anywhere where any any material from Cody Shad's site crossed over on their neighbor's property. Thank you. Any other questions for Cody? Okay. I got a couple more. Oh, go ahead. Um, so the mining permit, on a mining permit, is there some... Uh, element of that that controls the noise level and is it mon or is it monitored under the current 507 B no um, 507 B if if you look in the zoning ordinance is just a little tiny paragraph that says when it's required and then certain there's certain criteria that you got to submit with it like your haul roads how much material are taken out what type of material taken out um, unfortunately it's not very in-depth um, that's why we've put 320 in front of you guys to try to get that into place where that stuff's actually required. Is there any requirements as far as the time of operation? Can they run 24 seven or is there a, a time that you should start or best practice? There's, there's, there's nothing in the ordinance that says that we can really put anything, any of those types of restrictions on there. It doesn't say anything. I think as a board, you guys probably could, but us as staff couldn't 
couldn't recommend it. So you can put conditions. If you want, you can put conditions of time operation and um, that kind of thing if you want to put stipulations on with this permit today that we are discussing. I, I will say I believe under 507A, though, the construction stuff, I believe noise can be addressed, but I don't want to that be something I'd have to look into. <coughs> Any other questions for Cody? No. Not? Um, Mr. Shad, please. Good morning. Your name, sir? Good morning. It's Cody Shad. Um, so I guess I'd like to get started and, um, with saying, you know, the cement plant has absolutely nothing to do with this. This is, uh, um, a construction site for building a shop. The reason we're moving so much dirt is speaking with the neighbors before we started on this, Mark Wiley told me I have to have those buildings out of sight from the neighbor's view. So that's that was the start of why we were going so low. Um, so that was before I even purchased the property. And before I purchased the property, I made sure I had all the permits so that it would justify me being able to purchase the property without a risk. Um, so then once I purchased the property, it's been nonstop lies from Mark Wiley on, on speaking with every agency he possibly can speak to to try to get me in trouble or get me stopped. So for the last month, we actually haven't even been working. So I, I, I will need a, a time extension on that that hauling because, and, and right now too, our, like my excavator's not even parked on site. It's at the end of the road due to the false complaints that were given to MSHA. Um, so that we don't, you know, have to throw in hundreds of thousands of dollars more dealing with um, false complaints and and sending every person that goes or touches the, pro the property through par 48 MSHA training. And it's just, it's been a, it's been a nightmare since we started, um, but we would have never, I mean, buying that property in the beginning, I would have saved a lot of money just building where all the neighbors could see my structures. And instead, I spent the extra money to lower those structures so that they would be out of sight. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I... Well, Cody, what agencies, since you've started, have contacted you so you've decided not to work for a month? Well, that was because of that. That, that deciding not to work was... was um, a lot of complaints were coming in constantly so um, to the the planning department but the main reason was because of MSHA so then I also got fined from MSHA for not having a, um, a buying license before we started just because of the obvious connections Mark has because he's in the mining industry with one of the, the trainers at MSHA so he was able to to really make an impact there, um, you know, and then when I mentioned something about how the same complete complaints that he has for me that, that, you know, I would have those same complaints for, for his company, then he, then the MSHA guy told me that, oh, actually those complaints were from a mine in North Dakota. So you're, are you selling the gypsum? Uh, no, we do not get paid for the purchase of gypsum. Yeah, um, we're we're losing a lot of money because of that rock and 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 hauling that gypsum out and the cost of extracting that gypsum. Um, so with the hauling, um, the uh, the I think where the the thing with the cement plant um, hauling it for us or reimbursing us on the hauling, because I mean they are the only. The, it, we're very fortunate to have them because. This, this gypsum, you cannot use it as fill anywhere. I mean, I, I don't know if you guys are aware of like over on, I don't know, behind Taco John's on the west side, that big, that big hole. I don't know if, if they're aware of the source of that, but that's because gypsum in the water under there completely eroded that. It turned that, that gypsum soluble in water. It erodes, and now you got a, you know, a, a, a huge issue with, with sinkholes. So, um, you know, and legally we can't build on, we got to remove gypsum four feet under the foundation. 
So tell um, us, Cody, on MSHA, what's the process of MSHA um, when they come out? Um, tell us kind of, if we're not familiar as commissioners, what is the process of MSHA? I mean, for well, what you're doing. So with MSHA, they would, if this was put under MSHA, they would be able to govern everything we do. So if, if um, I have a blinker on a piece of equipment that doesn't work, it's a big fine. If I have a headlight out, even though that machine doesn't run at night, it's a big fine. If, you know, it's just fines. If, if I got people on site that are uh, um, not trained, it's a fine. If But you MSHA, know, you said contacted you and basically what did they say to you and what, what was that? Well, what they, they said to me that, um, that it was mine. So I tried to explain to MSHA what we were doing, that this is just a grading site, just like the other hundred sites we've graded where we've removed gyp to the, uh, you know, and the only place to take it is the cement plant. Um, and um, so I explained that to him and, and it was real obvious that he had sp spoken to somebody and was, was pushing on that. And uh, so he was dictating to me what I was doing as if he already, you know, I mean, he dictated to me that I was mining and that I was I'm like, no, just come look at the site and you'll, see. I mean, it's real obvious if you look at the site, we've got a graded pad and then there's a, a, a layer of gypsum that's right in our way that has to be removed to make the property valuable. And, and um, right now being there, it, it's, it's hindering the property's value. So he just left and said, okay, I can't do anything about this. No, he left and, and ran it through the channels and dictated that I need a mine license and that I'm like, well, I, I, I can't afford to do a mine license on this and keep up with your regulations and, and risky putting me bankrupt on fines. Um, so we re removed the excavator from the site and haven't touched the jet till I can get it resolved with them that, that I am, it's a grading site. I mean, it's like, you know, for example, on the interstate, they just graded the interstate and did hundreds and hundreds of thousands of uh, tons of gypsum. You know, they, they don't have a mining permit on that. And I mean, every state project, every contractor in the area, you know, if you encounter gypsum, you, you kind of have to bring it to the cement plant because there's no other way to get rid of it unless you pay 50 or 45 or whatever the number is per ton to bring it to the dump. And even, you know, I mean, it's... Thank you, commissioners. Questions? Cody, there's, it Art. seems to me that there's, <laughs> Madam Chair, that, that, that there's a couple of problems that the, that the residents out there have, and maybe we should just focus on uh, addressing those particular issues. One is dust. Right now, dust isn't a problem, it doesn't seem like, because of, like I said earlier, the amount of moisture we got, and now we've had a cold snap for a long period of time. Um, but what I'm trying to get done is that these folks aren't interfering with your your uh, construction job, and at the same time, you're not interfering with their lives and uh, as little as possible. And so, is there a an agreement that you can come to with them that basically, uh, when the dust does start coming up again, you you keep it watered down so that it's not affecting their their properties and um, and that uh, I think their other problem was is the damage that's being done to the road running large trucks up and down that road when that road wasn't really meant to handle that type of equipment um, are you willing to grade that road out keep it in good shape so that it doesn't get torn up when you're running your, your rigs up and down it it appears to me studying this issue, listening to what Brittany and Cody have to say that uh, you're doing what you're doing, you're doing uh, under our ordinances and under our restrictions. Um, and there's nothing more that we can uh, force upon you. So it's going to have to be just a, you know, a good neighbor agreement, it sounds to me, between you and the folks that are that were living out there before you bought the property 
and started your construction project. And it, and to me, it sounds like you you are you've tried to accommodate them and digging deep so that you can build your shop down low so they don't have to look at it and that kind of stuff. But maybe there's a few other areas that you can uh, go to address the, their complaints and make as little of an impact on them as, as possible. Um, and yet yeah. finish the project that you intended when you bought the property. Yep. I would, I would love to work with them. I, you know, at, at the beginning I did speak with, with Mark about, the um the the dust on the road to see if it would be okay if i put some mag water or something to eliminate the dust and i was told that i could not do that because it'll make potholes i would i would love to make that road a legit road because right now it's not there's no ditches all the all the water drains across the road um yeah i mean it's it's that the road needs ditches and it needs to be a a suitable road and I, I would not mind um doing that for the for the neighbors you know i i am so willing to to do whatever i can do to help the neighbors but when when lies and when it's constant trying to get me in trouble and trying to cost me money you know it makes me go from really wanting to help to to wanting to dictate to them that you know it'll be criminal if they trespass and it'll be you know, I, and going out of my w way to, I, you know, I mean, right now, you know, I, I would love to help and I would love to, to um, be a part of that development. And, but I don't want it, you know, a, a deal where it's just every time I turn around, I got to spend money trying to defend myself for lies that are created. And, you know, rightfully, so they, they, they do have the right to complain. It's their neighborhood. It's, you know, if, if, um, if there's dust or if there's road damage, um, you know, we, the, the road damage, I, if, if there's any of that, you know, they, they definitely have the right. And I, I would be more than willing to make, make that a, a legit road. And, um, you know, I even asked them what, what they thought if, if, uh, if I was able to pave that road to make it, you know, so we don't have to drive a dirt road to get back to the property. And that was a definite no that I wouldn't be allowed to pave that road. Um, but yes, I, I am more than happy to to work with the neighbors if it's if it's fair. All right. Okay. Thank you. Cody, did Appreciate you put it. some uh, gravel down, didn't you, on the road? We did put a little bit, but um, we haven't, you know, the, the road before I spend too much money gravel in it, I need to dig ditches and I need to put in culverts and I need to make it so that I'm not just wasting money on gravel. Um, I just otherwise. wanted people to know that you did put and did try to put some gravel down on that road and, and improve it a little bit from um, yeah. the and, trucks and the you things know, we, coming through. We graded it too. and um, But yes, that road does need a lot of gravel. But until there are ditches and culverts, it's there's no sense in wasting the money because all, all the, any, any water's flowing right over the road and, and saturating it and ruining the gravel anyway. Thank you. Mixing Commissioner Roskinect. Uh, Madam Chair, Cody, now the purchase of property is complete because a month ago, I believe, in another name. So now is the purchase 100% complete and, um, and it's in your name? It's in my name. It's on a, uh, the purchase was done through like a contract for deed. Um, but yes, it's, if you look up the property now, I would say most likely it should be in my name. So you purchase a property. I'm not going to ask you what you paid for it, but you purchase a property. Um, if you had the guess and you hired a private contractor to come in and do what you've done so far, I mean, are we, is this thing economically feasible, uh, with the amount of work that you've done? Is the value of the property increased by the cost of the work that you put in it so far? And where do you draw the limit? I would, I would say, yeah, I mean, it's 40 acres pretty much in the middle of, you know, I mean, not in the middle of Rapid City, but 40 acres in Rapid City. You look on the east side of town and 40 acres is going for millions. Um, and I see that being a lot nicer area, area than the, the east side. So I, I mean, I would, yeah, I would definitely say it, it, it is, it is worth it. But I mean, if, you know, with, with complaints about every 
vehicle driving in there and and um you know neighbors thinking that my land's their land and telling everyone that they need to come my gates are open and come into my land and inspect any issues and let's see what we can find for issues and you know i mean but yeah as a answer to your question yeah i see that property being worth worth a lot of money yeah, especially just you know, construction. And, and I, I, I paid a lot of money for it. I mean, I paid an ex I paid a lot of money for that land because I... The last question I got was, you were told that you had to lower that? Yes, I was told that I had to make it so that those buildings were not visible from the neighbors. So trying to work with the neighbors, I was like, all right, I, you know, I'll do that. I'll, I'll lower that, that whole site and make it so you can't see the buildings. Was that illegal? Could you... That, that was not a legal thing. That was me being nice and spending okay. my money to appease the neighbors so that I didn't have these type of issues when I went back there. Okay, that was, yeah, that was my question. Thank yeah. you. Do you remember what neighbors you talked to? Uh, well, so I talked to, I suppose I talked to four or five of them, and a, a lot of them were like, hey, it's it's your property. You can do whatever you want. Remember I don't know why you're asking why you're asking me and then when i talked to mark wiley mark wiley was the one who dictated that i need to do that but he from what i understood i mean he's obviously the guy riling up the riling everyone up on this so i mean but yeah so it was mark wiley that told me that i needed to make those i needed to cut that grade low enough that the neighbors could not see the building okay did he give you a reason why he just didn't want to see the buildings no i just i mean I don't, I don't think I did get a reason. I guess I don't, I can't tell you for sure. But I mean, I was just. So Cody, do you usually do a job site and then someone said, I like that lower and you change it based on that you already have plans and things for a building because someone told you to? Well, um, so that was dictated before my, my design of the property was completed. But no, on, the only way that that would happen is if the person paying the bill told me that, then, then, um, it would be changed according to the what they like. Did you also change it because it needed to be in that specific area because it worked better than putting it somewhere else that they could see them? So no, um, the easiest and the best for me would have had keeping them high above that gyp layer and having it so the whole development can see my buildings. That would have been by far the easiest and by far the cheapest. And it would have made a, a good enough site and it would have... You know, it it wouldn't have made quite as good of a site as what it will with lowering it, but it the the cost savings would have been worth just leaving it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, Madam Chair? Commissioner Corey. Cody, could you tell me what what exactly you're using going to use the property for? I think we've been concentrating on the permit and the mining and all that stuff, but when you talked about your intentions for the, the property and what you want to do for it. Can you tell me what, what that is? Well, um, right now, you know, I was keeping it for my personal stuff. Um, but with the amount of expenses that I'm being forced to, to spend, you know, now I'm looking at like, I don't know, being, it's all, you know, like trailers and stuff coming in there. Maybe I make a big old trailer park. I don't know. Maybe I do. But I mean, as of right now, it it was for my enjoyment, but it's has not been enjoyable one bit due to, well, Mark Wiley. Okay. So I mean, so I, it's it's up in the air. I mean, it's it's forty acres on the interstate. That's um, that I saw a lot of potential for, and I I see in my lifetime that that land being. Uh, very valuable, variable, very usable land. Okay. So right now my goal was to make it the most valuable it can with the grading and, and then use it for whatever, you know. Yeah. I, I, I just wanted to ask because, I, you know, from, from our conversations, it's the most conversation I've had with the applicant since this and, and knowing your intentions and how things, you know, you did, did the investigating before you bought the property and and trying to please uh, the best that you could. I'm sure if you knew there was some type of opposition like this, 
you wouldn't have obligated to the financial commitment that it takes to do it. Um, and that was one of the reasons why I just I asked for what kind of notice there was, and, and you explained that you've talked to the people out there, and that's, I needed to know that there was some notice and some talk of that. Thanks. Yeah, yep. I, I tried to get a hold of, I called, I looked up everybody's parcel, and I called every number I could to, to try to get a hold of everybody. And then, um, you know, Mark kind of portrayed to me that he was kind of the boss out there. So I, uh, and then he dictated to me that I had to have it lower. And so it's like, all right, well, I'll make that work and went ahead with my grading plan, got all the plans done before I closed on the property, got all the permits done. And then after everything was approved, I, I closed because it. One, one final comment, you know, one of the reasons why I asked that Cody and, and to the commission is so often change is hard, not only for, for people, but for the community in that area. And, and so when they started seeing the changes, it, they may have changed their mind at, at the last minute, but by then you're committed. And so I understand what you're talking about, but change is hard. So that was one of the reasons why I wanted to clarify that, you know, the property is, the mining permit was something that was brought up to need to be done. and and it was issued for six months, so it wasn't gonna be for long term. And I think what you were doing was to remove the site, remove it to the site so you could complete what your initial plan was to do, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah, my, it's not, my plan it's right not now- not to purchase or sell for profit. Um, the gypsum. No, okay. no, the gypsum, I am losing a lot of money okay. getting rid of that gypsum. Okay. Um, an, an, an extreme amount of money. And I mean, I, if anyone's ever had rock bid on any of their sites, you would, you know what I mean. Okay. Um, but yeah, in my plans right now, the plans I submitted, I don't plan on anything, anything different. But if, if I keep getting monies costed to me for made up reasons or for maybe justifiable reasons or, or whatever, then I'm going to have to look at recouping that money and whether it be, yeah. you know, going instead of, you know, cause it'll put me in a position where I can't afford to hang on to that land. Yeah. It'll, I'll have to, I'll have to start selling. Any other questions for Cody? No. I have a couple. So right now you're using it to build yourself a house and a shop or what are you basically building there, Cody? Um, so we're going to, the, the, the house has been, um, <laughs> there was a fire and it, the house is, was in, in uh, damage. So we're going in and we're, we're fixing the house up. And so that, that was gonna be my brother's house. And then, and then I was building a, a shop out there too. So basically you're gonna have a commercial shop there for your stuff and then you're gonna have your brother's residence. No, it won't, it's not gonna be a commercial shop there. But if, you know, if a guy was allowed a commercial shop there, that would, make that va that land value more valuable and it would help me. So bottom uh, line, you started this, you bought this property to have your brother live out there and to have your shop out there for some of your equipment or whatever. And then what happened in that interim is you found gypsum, <laughs> you, have a, you had a, a considerable <coughs> amount, you had to use 507B, a construction permit as well to uh, take some of that. So it wasn't for mining in the first place. It's just when you found the gypsum, you needed to get rid of a bunch because you are a contractor and you needed to build on that site. So the whole idea wasn't to go into mining on this property. It was to build a job site or build a house with a um, shop on it. Madam so, Chair. Commission. Right. Yeah, it and that sounds to me like the only reason that he had to remove the gypsum was to uh, meet the requirements of the neighbor that asked him to drop the building below the level of the gypsum so that it was not able to be seen. Is that correct? That's correct. There might have been some that had to be removed just, but I mean, it would have been so minimal of an amount that it wouldn't have. And the bottom line here is um, the Shads are developers. So if he decides not to do this and needs to recoup his costs, legally he can put a development right. on that property and develop it and then not just have a brother in a shop there, he could actually put 
a development out there. So I think um, um, he can take his mining permit and his 507B and say, nope, I don't need that anymore. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start building some properties out here on the land that works. So um, just food for thought there that you can have this or you can have a full-fledged development and legally uh, he can do that. And they do build some pretty nice properties, uh, the Shads do. So um, just food for thought. Thank, Thank you. you, Cody. Let's have Mark Wiley up here. Good morning. My name is Mark Wiley. I live at 3901 Marvin Road. Um, I'm not leading up anything. You've seen everybody here repeatedly. We've been in, this is the fourth time we've been here. Some of the other people had conflicts they couldn't make it. I initially bumped into Cody Shad when we, somebody was down on Van Houten's property. So we went down and we met him at that time. He said he was gonna buy, him and his brothers were gonna buy the property and put in a kind of a shop and I said, okay. And so that proceeded and then he got a building permit and we weren't notified. Uh, Russ Brown and Bob Watts were never notified concerning a building permit or anything else. So he, he showed up and he started and he asked me about blading the road and I said, well, we don't really need any blading right now. And he commented about uh, putting some rock on the road and I said, well, not, not at this point. Then it got a little muddier and he said, well, I can put some rock down there. And I said, well, go ahead. And that was never done. So it's, <laughs> We proceeded, I asked him not to run that large hole up the road, he did anyway, which, you know, he has legal access, he can do whatever he wishes. So as far as lowering that pole barn that he's discussed or that shop, I never talked to him about the elevation. Russ Brown did, who lives immediately adjacent to that. And Russ mentioned to me that he was gonna, gonna lower it and take out all that jib. And I said, well, I, I guess he can do that, but I said, there's, down below where that old house is, would we be way down below anybody's eyesight? I mean, there's a perfect flat spot down there. All you'd have to do is take out that chunk of jip down out there and take down the house, which needs to be taken out anyway, and there'd be a perfect spot to put a shop. There's water down there, there's power, and there's a septic tank down there. So, you know, whatever is going on, I don't know. Our concern is, is the dust and the impact on our property values with the dust and, and, and the heavy truck traffic on the road is what we've complained about. Now, I did not call M. Shaw. I don't know who did. All I did is stop down to the DENR office and, and find out if he had the proper uh, erosion control program going. That's all I did. And usually you need wattles and some silt fence to control some of that erosion. They've not gotten back to me on that, so I'm sure he's, he's got his plan. Maybe he does. But all we're concerned about is the dust, the noise, and the heavy truck traffic on the road. And, and then the repeated truck traffic and the construction equipment in and out on the weekends. It's, it wasn't supposed to be a commercial operation. It was supposed to be just his hobby shop. And that was all it was supposed to be. And then maybe 20, 25 years down the road, he said he was going to develop it and do something with it. But... All we're looking for is, you know, if he's got a mining permit and he's gonna remove this material, there should be at some end point when that stops. When he's excavated enough and he's gonna put in his pole barn and he's done. And then the equipment will stop going in and out and the trucks will stop going in and out. That's all we're looking for. Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Commissioner DeSanto. It, so, and you've, uh, you've, excuse me, you've heard from all the other residents up there numerous times. Right. So. And you've seen the pictures. It appears to me, Mark, that that is what's going to happen. Um, as soon as he gets the grade for the building excavated, and the, pro the reason that he had to dig so deep was to get rid of all that gypsum so that he could get that under the line of sight. Now, I, I think if you, if you bought a 40-acre piece of property for your own use and chose a spot for your shop, um, you wouldn't more than likely that was your cho choice as to where you wanted to put that shop. And if somebody came along and said, you know, if you just stuck it down there somewhere, well, there's probably a real a purpose why Cody decided to put that shop where he decided to put it. 
And it sounds to me like he accommodated either you or Mr. Brown um, by removing that gypsum, dropping the level of the shop down so that it wouldn't be visible to mm -hmm. the neighborhood around. Um, he's offered right here in front of us, and I've got it written down, that he'll take care of the road however you guys want him to take care of the road. If you well, want him to grade it, seen, if you want him to... Excuse me, you've seen the estimate I gave you on graveling that road. That was in that one of the first packets I gave you. Right. Okay. That's a lot of money. It is. That's 60, he's offering to... He's, that's $60,000 to, like he's to, to put, put it four down. inches of base course down, grade it, and compact it. And that's not even considering creating ditches. The ditches we have, we maintain. The culverts we have, we have very little erosion on that road. So... You know, as far as I can understand, him wanting to upgrade it if he wants to develop that and put something else down there. Right. But up until that point, there's nothing wrong with the road. We take care of the road. But if the road gets beat up, he's willing to, yep. to yeah, take he's care willing of to, that problem. He, he One time he come up there with a blade, and I, he, I stopped and talked to him, and I said, you need to get those ruts done because he created ruts, and then they were froze. Mm -hmm. And I said, you need to smooth them out if you could. Well, he had one of his guys drive through with a blade, and it was 55 degrees, and they created more ruts than what we had to begin with. So then it refroze again. And then my neighbor, he came down, I think, and, and smoothed it out. But um, that's all we're looking for is an end spot, an end point to the dust and the truck traffic. I mean, on, on 320, there should be a limit on how much is going to be removed and when that stops. That's all we're looking for. Thank you. So, Mr. Wiley, the end point is six months, is what he's trying to tell you um, he had for grading mm -hmm. and the gypsum and the trucks. He's willing to help with the road where the issues are. The dust, it looks like, and, if, and we know already um, from even living on paved roads, the dust that comes off of Fifth Street, mm -hmm. I can dust one day and it's, it's pretty dusty. I can't imagine on a, on a gravel road that that sediment at this point from probably November till now for dust is probably not that bad. Meaning when we saw pictures, how long have the how long has that sat there? That was more you know what I'm saying? That was that was during the blizzard that we had. Yeah. That dust come out of there. Now when it dries out, there's gonna be a lot more dust. But if you see from the pictures when you go out there from Cody, there's no dust going except he said from the road. Mm -hmm. So the sediment um, can't be proven maybe, or the, the sediment that has been in neighbor's yards in the pictures we've seen, that could be from the road as well. No, no. The sediment you see on most of those pictures, the road, most of the travel on that road is south of where those residences are. Right. Okay, so the road has no impact on that dust. Now the dust on the road is, is brownish in color. It's gravel, it's not red like coming off of the, the site itself. So there's a difference. Uh, Russ and Kathy and Bob, they live north of, right. the only people that drive into Russ and Kathy's and Jennifer Smith's is just those two families. They don't generate that much dirt. That dirt come off that site. Okay, so you believe the dust is from his site and he does have a water truck. Number right. two, the noise mm -hmm. was the complaint. Now, with the cold weather and after, he, he probably put some water down on him, and then that's froze in right now. So that's why you didn't see any dust on the video. Okay. So once it starts to dry and the temperatures heat up and it's disturbed, it's going to blow. So bottom line, what was the noise complaint that people uh, said? He used a hammer drill on his hoe. One day out there, he was, he was breaking the jip apart all day long. Okay. And, he, and then, and of course, I'm, uh, Bob Watts and Russ Brown are impacted by the noise more than I am. I'm one of the first ones in the subdivision on the right, so they're more impacted by the noise than, than I would be. But I did hear the hammer running all day long. Basically, more. temporary dust because he's going to have a job site or a place where his brother and him live. Mm -hmm. um, and the noise from the hammer is going to be gone because he's going to have the site done. So what he is is doing typical building at this point for his property in order to build something and giving you six months time to get this done before the noise and the dust. <clears throat> um, I, I think that's pretty fair um, when you're trying to build, you know, some property and it could be worse. Like you said, if, 
if if it becomes a problem, it makes sense with anybody that owns some property. Um, he might sell some parcels off and having 10 people there and that dust and that noise and that problem is going to get mm -hmm. a lot worse than having him doing a job site with one house and one uh, Well, one quite shop, frankly, so. Deb, if I were to buy a piece of property, I would go up and talk with that length with those homeowners up there. Nobody was ever contacted by anybody. I talked to him a couple of times and Russ did talk to him a couple of times concerning his uh, building and Russ said, well, it's your ground, you know, that's where you got that reference, you can do with it what you want. And he, and Russ said, well, or Cody said he was gonna build it right there and, and Russ said, well, I'll be able to see it. He said, well, I'm, I'm gonna take out all that, all that jet and get it lowered. So that was his decision to do that, nobody else's. Right, and it's his property and he has to take the jet right. out in order to make a building site that's right. actually buildable. So yep. again, it, it's his property trying to make a difference on his property. Mm -hmm. He's disturbing, if he is with dust in the future, that has to be addressed because um, we'll be checking to make sure it's not with the dust, but the noise I see is temporary trying to build something. So some of that, just like your property, if you're building things, it's gonna make noise for a little bit, but it's not gonna be forever until you get that property where you need to, to get you know your site building. So. Some of that has to be a little bit consideration of the guy trying to build. Mm -hmm. And and they do build very nice stuff. And I can tell you from roads and things from the Shads in the past, um, they have done what they said with trying to help the neighbors with roads and things. So um, he's built some pretty nice roads and pr pretty nice um, areas for people to travel on that I've seen. Um, the last time we, we had one was up in, uh, on top of 16 on that property. And uh, he built a really nice road and, and stuff with it and very nice property there that actually improved um, the values of the properties in those areas. So um, just from experience, um, I, I can see there's property rights on both sides, but I think once you see the, the end result from this, I think the neighbors will be, their values will go up and, and hopefully the dust and the noise will dissipate in the next six months. What we're concerned about is the end result and that there is no end result in sight from, from what we can see. Well, he has a six month permit is all. Okay, so, so come summer and the dust starts blowing again, or do we have other options again? Or? Madam Chair. Commissioner LeCoy. I, I <clears throat> didn't mean to interject, oh, but you, did. You're good. But, you know, the delays that are happening now, I, from the testimony I've heard, he's already made the comment that he may have to ex uh, ask for an extension to get mm -hmm. it done because he's had to stop and slow down. So a lot of the concerns that have come this far have delayed it. So I expect as a commissioner that there probably will be an, an extension. Mm -hmm. But that's why I asked. The initial start out was six months. It's not an ongoing thing that's going to be continuously every month are going on for the whole year. It, it, there is an end site. He has so much to get done. Once it's done, it's done. Mm -hmm. okay. Madam Chair. Commissioner Ross Connect. So is it too late for you and Cody to mend fences where you can literally sit down at the same table? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Is it too late to mend fences with Cody so that you guys can sit down at the same table? and try to work this out so we don't have to have this meeting in a month from now? Well, we've discussed things before, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure good intentions, but never get around to doing it. You know, and, and it, people are like that. That's just life. So we don't have a problem with that. It's just that, you know, uh, during this period of time, our land values are impacted. Our living environment is impacted. You know, we were, we've been there for 20-some years. You know, we've been there a long time, paid a lot of taxes. And so all of a sudden now all that changes and we have no, no say, no control, no. Well, I think the only legal recourse we have as a commission is to probably make sure that dust is not an issue. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know what the answer to that is, but uh, hopefully there's a solution so we don't have the dust problem. Other than that, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. I don't know what we can legally do because we're, we're our hands are tied to a certain extent, but sure. I'm with you on the dust. I, I, it needs to be controlled. I just don't know who's going to monitor it. I don't think the county should. I think there should be a private contractor involved that 
uh, makes that decision. Unbiased mm -hmm. contractor, that's my opinion. Yeah. Madam Chair. Commissioner Drews. I don't really have any questions. Uh, Cody, when I, when I went out and, and looked at it, I was uh, rather amazed at the amount of area uh, that you're working, but as I understand from planning, you could be working a lot more of the area than you, than you currently are. And so I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, going to be critical uh, of any of that. Um, I think Ron has kind of hit it on the head that uh, be nice if, uh, if you and the neighbors could sit down, talk about the, the plan, and move forward with what your, what your intent is. Uh, it's unfortunate that you've had to stop. Uh, I don't know anything about the MSHA deal. <coughs> don't know anything about you know uh, what what they have you know in order to to make it stop uh, at this point in time for you not to bring your equipment back on the property. Uh, but hopefully that can be worked out and you can move forward. I think there has to be some kind of an understanding between everybody to allow you to continue on and get done what you plan on doing, or, or it is going to continue on for a much longer period of time than what your neighbors probably want it to. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you're investing, obviously, a lot of expense in that property. Uh, and, I mean, I know you don't, even though the equipment may be your own, you don't run that equipment for nothing. Uh, that's a big expense. So. <clears throat> Um, I would I would highly encourage what Ron just su suggested or Commissioner Rosconeck and somehow or another sit down, uh, talk it out, figure out a little bit of a plan that uh, satisfies the neighbors from the standpoint of understanding uh, when it's going to end. Uh, obviously, that has to also depend on when you can get back in there and get to work and uh, how much more material you need to remove from there. So that's Thanks. my comments. Thank you. So bottom line, guys, we're, we're hoping you guys can uh, work this out between the neighbors and you with the dust. It sounds like the biggest issue and that maybe you can have a meeting because I think it's in the best interest of the neighbors and the best interest of Cody um, to be able to finish this so he can get his expenses um, not any more than they are today. <clears throat> because, again, um, as a business person, if it becomes too expensive, it's time to sell or it's time to build. And uh, I think in the best interest of neighbors, it's best to work with Cody because they do build. Okay. So just my personal opinion. Um, but uh, I think um, I've worked with Cody before on uh, some of the stuff with the planning and he's worked with neighbors and other people and he's actually found good solutions with them. So I'm gonna encourage what um, Ron and, and uh, Mr. Drews is saying with you, sir. And I, I hopefully in the in the future with the dust and some other issues, um, <coughs> he can be a good neighbor to you guys even better than um, he has been before with some of the um, road and some of the things that you need help with because um, he's known for helping on those kind of things. Madam Chair, I've got sure. one more thing I'd like to make a comment on. Commissioner Ross, connect and then oh, you. Sorry, sir. I was going to say if you guys do get together, would you? Can you put something in writing and share it with us so that we know where this is at, if it's getting better, if it's not good, if it's stalemate, so that we can kind of see where it's going, okay. whether it's going north or south. Okay. Appreciate it. All right. Mr. Wiley. Yeah, the only comment I'd like to make is I hope that you go ahead and pass 320 and get it on your books and really look at some of those issues so you can protect other people's property rights and their living environment. <clears throat> we live up there for a reason. And everybody gets along. Everybody knows each other extremely well. So I just hope you adopt that and you tighten it up a little bit. So Madam somebody Chair. else doesn't have to come in here with the same issues. Commissioner DeSanto. I, I pointed this out to some folks that came in last year that were upset about some building projects that were going on around their house out off of Highway 79. And so I'm going to point it out again. I, I just bought a house four years ago and I can sit on, I used to be able to sit on my back deck and look out across mm -hmm. beautiful acreage and there was nothing there sure well now there's um six new apartment complexes that have gone in that they're out there putting the roof on at 6 30 in the morning every morning and um and now there's going to be a an entire storage unit built there so instead of looking out on this nice property with cattle grazing around on it i'm looking at a storage unit and six apartment complexes change happens and and you can't uh, 
you can't tell somebody that bought property what they can and what they can't do to a limit um, with their property. And you may have uh, bought a place thinking, hey, this is an awesome place and it's a beautiful view. And the next thing you know, you got somebody developing the property across the street. And the only way to avoid that was if I would have walked across the street and made an offer on that piece of property, I could have bought my view. Yep. Um, and so that's something that I, I think people really need to keep in mind um, when these things happen is that we have very little control over what happens around our environment unless we control our environment. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, most people don't have the kind of money to go buy a 40 acre piece of property just to protect their view. Yeah. Well, all I'd like to say to that is all we expect is some reasonable accommodation. You know, the heavy truck traffic on that road is not reasonable. Gotcha. And uh, uh, neighbor, Tom Cantrell, he has nine grandkids that are out there on the weekends playing around that road and during the week. And it's dangerous to have those big trucks up there hauling. So I hope he resolves it. I hope it gets done quickly and he gets what he wants out of it. So that's all I got to have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wiley. And um, hope, hopefully Madam with uh, with uh, Cody, you could resolve that, Mr. Wiley. And I'm hoping uh, that we can have better communication out there and, and yeah. we can have some good neighborly talks to each other. And bottom line, that goes a long ways for um, people wanting to build out there. He's also going to be your neighbor. Mm -hmm. um, so um, hopefully uh, people can visit with him. And, and uh, like I said, he's pretty easy to talk to. Um, go out there and visit and kind of see what he's doing and how he's doing it. We'll do what we can. Okay. okay. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. We do have a county website that you can uh, send uh, messages Comments. to okay. one commissioner, and I would suggest that you uh, use that often and keep us posted. Okay. We will. Thank you. Appreciate your uh, folks coming here a couple of times, and, and hopefully we've uh, discussed this enough where we're kind of going where we need to in the future with it. Hopefully we'll go in the right direction. <laughs> thank you, All sir. Right, thank you. Mr. Lloyd Ducray. I, I just got one question for staff. For staff. Sorry. When these type of reviews come up, I've noticed on some conditions of the past planning ones that you have a $100 fee for every review, for the review of uh, planned uh, conditional use. Now, is there one for this no. type of review or... Are we singling out one than, than the others? There will not be, for these two permits on 320, there will be review fees. Okay, I'm, I'm but under 507 A and B, there are not review fees currently. Um, and one other item, excuse me, Brittany Molitor, um, for the record, um, staff would be willing to meet with both the neighbors and the contractor and kind of go over where we are with what our ordinance says, things that we can do um, to help out with the situation also. Um, and just a point of clarification, the construction permit is good until, or is in place until the final stabilization is reached. So what happens is it's good for a year and then the planning director can um, extend it for another year. After that, they would have to pay again to keep going until they reach that final stabilization. The mining permit um, is the one that limits the amount of gypsum in the time frame. So they would have to get that gypsum out of there within the six months, or they would have to go in front of planning commission, or Mr. Shaw would have to go in front of planning commission and request that that um, condition be amended for a longer period of time. Do we need to do anything with this? We don't have to do a motion if we're not changing anything, right? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Madam Chair, I suggest a five minute recess before we go into Board of Adjustment. Okay. Five minute recess, Board. Motion? Second. Motion by Drew, second by Roskinet. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, motion carries. Motion to go into Board of Adjustment, please. So moved. Moved by LaCroix, second by DeSanto. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries. Item 17, please. Item 17, oh, good morning, Brittany Molitor, Interim Planning Director. Item 17 is variance VA 1913 to reduce the minimum required front yard setback from 25 feet to zero feet and to reduce a western property line from eight feet to three feet. As the property stands today, it is zoned suburban residential district. It consists of 
0.16 acres access is taken off of Meadow Ridge Drive. There is no special flood hazard area on the subject property and the lot contains a single family residence and a shed and water and sewer is supplied via the Rapid Valley Sanitary District. Uh, criteria for considering a variance. There are four criteria that must be considered that specific circumstances or conditions such as exceptional narrowness topography or siting exist. Uh, staff verified through a site visit that there is no particular conditions which warrant approval. That the variance does not grant a use which is otherwise excluded from the particular district. The setback variance would not grant a use which is otherwise excluded in suburban residential district. That due to the specific circumstance or existing conditions, strict application of the zoning ordinance would be an unwarranted hardship or unwarranted hardship. Strict application of the zoning ordinance would require the applicant to meet the setbacks for a suburban residential district. And finally, that granting of a variance is not contrary to the public interest and is in harmony with the general purposes and intent of the zoning ordinance. Granting the setback would grant a setback that is reduced in the zoning district, which is not in harmony with the intent of our zoning ordinance. Uh, this uh, what request was routed through the interdepartmental review. A couple items of concern did come back. Uh, one was from our county highway department. Um, they are not in favor of reducing the front yard setback. Uh, the second was from the Rapid City Community Planning. Uh, they indicated that Meadow Ridge Drive uh, is identified as a collector street in the city's major street plan and requires a 68 foot right of way. And currently, Meadowwood Drive is only 66 foot of right of way. And at some point, if additional right of way is needed, yeah. um, it could cause issues with, um, <coughs> sorry, um, with improving that road. Uh, staff did talk to the applicant um, on December 5th, and he had indicated that he spoke with Janelle Fink of Fisk Land Surveying and that he no longer would like to have the side yard setback reduced because he does not want to uh, vacate the utility and minor drainage easements. So he is just requ requesting the zero foot setback in the front yard setback. Uh, staff um, does not make recommendations on variance as they are against our zoning ordinance. However, if the Board of Adjustment wishes to approve this variance, there are two conditions that we are suggesting. Okay, thank you, Ms. Brittany. I think we have a couple commissioners that would like okay. it continued. Um, okay. They'd like to go look at the property and um, they haven't had time uh, this last week since it had came up. Okay. Um, so if um, we apologize to the applicant or people that wanna speak on this issue today, um, we need a little bit more time uh, till the next meeting to go and review and and see the property. So, um, if you'd like, well, we could. You're right. If they'd like to speak today, did anybody fill out a speaker request for to uh, for this uh, number seventeen today, seventeen A? The applicant is in the audience also. Okay. And we apologize to the applicant. If you'd like to speak today, you can. If not, we're going to have it back up in about two weeks. Okay. Um, Coming. Huh? Come on up, sir. You're okay if we continue it for two weeks to come out and look, sir? Okay, thank you, sir. I'll um, make that as a motion. Motion by Drews. Second. Second by DeSanto. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Adam, motion carries. Adam Chair, can I ask a question before we? On, on continuance? Oh, okay. That's okay, fine. thank you. <laughs> Item B. Morning, Commissioners. Jason Tennyson, County Planner. <coughs> Agenda item B is variance 1917. Applicant is Brian Barber. He is in the audience if you have any questions for him. Applicant has requested variance 1917 to allow lot sizes less than 40 acres in a general agriculture district. Purpose of the variance is to allow the applicant to divide a portion of the subject property and create two separate lots, both approximately 10 acres in size. Zoning ordinance requires the Board of Adjustment to determine that four specific criteria are met. Those are on the screen for your consideration. I'll read staff's response. Starting with number one, subject property is flat grassland without any exceptional narrowness topography or siting. The buildable space on the parcels does not appear to be limited. Number two, this variance to lot size would not grant a use which is otherwise excluded from the property zoned as general agriculture district. Number three, Strict application of the zoning ordinance would require the existing property to meet the minimum lot size requirements of 40 acres in general agriculture zoning district or be rezoned to an appropriate zoning district. And lastly, number four, 
Granting this lot size variance does not appear to be contrary to the public interest. The staff has not received any calls or letters of complaint or concern. If variance 1917, or if approved, variance 1917 would allow for two new lots in a general agriculture district, each, each approximately 10 acres, which is not in harmony with the zoning ordinance. <clears throat> As it sits today, uh, the parent parcel is zoned general agriculture district. There is no special flood hazard area on the property. Uh, consists of approximately 204 acres. Uh, the creation of the two new lots would be through eloquent description. On your screen is uh, the proposed lots there in blue towards the bottom. Uh, very, the very bottom one would be 10 acres. The other one above it would be a, a little less than 10 acres. Current and future land use of the surrounding, pro surrounding properties within three mile radius are identified as general agriculture district. The applicant has chosen to request this variance in lieu of a rezone and comprehensive plan amendment in order to avoid spot zoning in the area. If the Board of Adjustment chooses to approve variance 1917, staff does not recommend any conditions be included. And again, the applicant is in the audience if you have any questions for him. Thank you. Commission, would you like to hear from the applicant? Sure. Okay. Mr. Barber, sir. Good morning, commissioners. Do you have questions for me? Any Madam questions? Chair? Commissioner DeSanto? Is it your uh, plan to build on those properties? Not myself. My plan is to, to put those two properties up for sale. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or motion? Move for approval. Second. Moved by DeSanto, second by Ross Connect. Any other questions? Not? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. And there is a well. There is a well on that property in furniture. Okay. On the 10 acres or the 9.3? I think it's towards the uh, it'd be on the south portion the the one to the south it'd be the exact actual ten. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank uh, you. Next is a thank you oh come on exact, come up. our <laughs> board of adjustment. <laughs> thank you, Lloyd. Moved by Lloyd <coughs> or Mr. Lacroix, Commissioner Lacroix, second by. I'll second. DeSanto. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries. Thank you. Consent agenda, Ms. Brittany. Uh, the Board of Commissioners <coughs> uses a consent agenda to act on non-controversial and routine planning and zoning items quickly. The consent agenda is acted upon by one motion and vote of the Board. Items may be removed, by, removed from the consent agenda and placed on the regular agenda at the request of a Board member or a citizen. The consent agenda for the planning and zoning contains the following items. Item C is layout plat PL or LPL 1944 for Gordon and Jennifer Sapo. And Planning Commission re recommended to deny without prejudice. Uh, item D is Planning Development Review PU 0607 for Rapid City MHP LLC, aka the Cimarron Mobile Home Park. And the Planning Commission recommended approval of the extension. Okay, is there anybody in the public or the audience that would like to speak on item C and D today? If not, is there a commissioner that would like to remove any items C and D off the consent items today? If not, a uh, motion. Can I uh, ask motion? a question without removing it? Have Brittany. Um, let's go ahead and remove one if you need to. Well, let's let's remove the uh, D. Let's see, this is the uh, E or D. It is uh, on the table. So uh, item C. So, motion to approve item D, please. Not even asking if there was anyone in the, in the audience. Or the board? Just... Item D. Okay. Is that what you said? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, move, move by Hadcock, second by LaCroix. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? <clears throat> motion carries. Okay. Item D, sir. Commissioner Drews. Uh, Steve. Uh, Sorry. Brittany, a question on that. When. Uh, your recommendation to deny without prejudice, what rights does that give that property owner if we do that? They have the ability to come back and submit a layout plat that was similar um, 
and without paying the fees. So what happened on this request is that there was a, buy, a purchaser and the seller, they had a discrepancy in the amount of property um, that they were talking about. So when in speaking with the surveyor, um, they have already resubmitted a new layout plan with uh, differentiating lot lines. So. Okay, so is there a time frame on that? How much time do they have? A year. A year, okay. That's all I needed, thank you. I would, uh, I would move approval. Move approval on item D from Drew, second. C. C. C, I keep saying D, sorry. Second. Item C, Drew's as the first, LaCroix is the second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries. Madam item Chair, D, please regular. We have a request from the audience to reconsider item 17B. You did not ask for public comment and there are people here in the audience to speak on the Barber variants. Okay, I thought we did, but that's okay. We can reconsider if we, we are going to continue it and speak in two weeks on it. No. No. No, that's not. That's, that's the uh, one that you just approved. No. Oh. The variance we just approved for the I town. Apologize. Madam Chair, I would, uh, I would move to reconsider uh, item 17B. First, Second. First, we will do a opening of board of adjustment again, oh, yeah. if I'm correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay, let's open Board of Adjustment. Move to go Board of Adjustment. Second. By LaCroix, second by DeSanto. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries. Next, we now, will. Now I would make the motion to reconsider. And I'll second that. Consider by Drews and second by DeSanto. Item B, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries. And I apologize uh, to the audience member that I missed on public comment on Brian Barber. Uh, if you'd like to come up, please come up. I apologize, ma'am. I thought you were the applicants for. Okay. Which mic? Either uh, one, ma'am. My name is Carol Hendrickson. Uh, I am a resident of the Lower Spring Creek area up the road a ways from this property. Um, our road has been heavily impacted by the development that's already taken place in the Spring Creek area, Acres area. Um, which is just south of me. And it's my understanding that Mr. Barber has all of his property up for sale. And is this just the beginning of breaking up these pieces one at a time till we get all these five, 10 acre and 9.5 acre pieces of property in our area? This is ranch land. It's very difficult to get livestock across the road uh, machinery or equipment up and down the road because of the impact of the heavy traffic we have. We have no shoulder on that road. And um, I just think you need to stop and think about it before we keep just putting little chunks, little chunks, little chunks everywhere. Thank you. Any questions? Word? No questions? Um, you know, this is zoned agricultural. So it seems to be very easy to just shove that out the door and you know what's going to stop that is there anything that can stop it if there is I'm going to get all my neighbors together because you know it's 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 taking away the integrity of our ranch land and our ranch properties my place has probably been in the family longer than any place there I'm probably the oldest resident there and um, you know it's just taking away the integrity of our ranch land Thank you for coming today, ma'am. How many acres does she own? Ma'am, Ms. Hendrickson, how many acres do you own? One of the commissioners asked. 640. Okay. Thank you. Do we have a motion? I would still move for approval. Moved by DeSanto. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Drew's discussion. Madam All Chair. Of, sorry, Commissioner DeSanto. I just want to point out what I pointed out to the last folks is that uh, when somebody wants to do something with their property, um, even though we do have the right to, to deny this, um, there are other areas that have already been able to develop out there as well. And if the ranchers, which I have great respect for, I've got ranchers in my family, um, 
don't want this happening, then when these pieces of property come up for sale, they need to buy these pieces of property. Um, otherwise, these pieces of property are, there's a good possibility they're gonna get developed. A 40 acre piece of property isn't big enough to farm, it's not big enough to ranch, it's, uh, and uh, when he's got that separate piece of property across the road from him, that's uh, or 19.5 acres, there's really not a whole lot he can do with that piece of property either. I, under, I understand the effects of increasing the number of people on Spring Creek Road can make it more difficult to get your, your equipment down the road and get the cattle across the road and that kind of stuff. But uh, again, um, if you decided to take 40 acres of your ranch land or maybe once you're no longer ranching it and it passes on to the next generation, um, I don't think that you would be very appreciative of us telling you you can't do that with your property. It's your property. So that's just my thought process on it. I'm sure. Commissioner Ross. When I looked at this, I I keep thinking, you know, we we brag as a community that, you know, we, we, we're going to see growth, you know, growth in our schools uh, with the B21 coming and this growth, people need a place to live. And I think this is just going to be what we're going to see in the future. And it's, it's got to go somewhere. And, and uh, these larger 160s are being divided in the quarters and the quarters are being divided in the 40s and the 40s are being divided in the 10s. And I've been watching this for 40 years. And I just don't know that we can stop it. It's just uh, trying to provide the supply to the demand. We do have a motion by DeSanto, second by Drews. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. We need to close Board of Adjustment, please. So moved. Second. Moved by Drews, second by DeSanto. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Sorry I missed the young lady that was here today. I apologize for that. Usually I ask for public comment. I just figured there wasn't anybody, and that was my fault because we had no speaker request, so I apologize. Next, we're on item E through G, the uh, regular agenda item. E, please. Good morning, Commissioners. Jason Thenison, County Planner. Uh, agenda item E is rezone 1917 and comprehensive plan amendment 1917. Applicant is David Grover. He is in the audience if you have any questions for him. The applicant has submitted a request to rezone 12.83 acres from General Agriculture District to Low Density Residential District. Applicant is also requesting to amend the Pennington County Comprehensive Plan to change the future land use from plan unit development sensitive to Low Density Residential District. Uh, board has seen this property before when uh, the applicant subdivided under and, create, and was created under Minor Plat MPL 1919. This rezone and comprehensive plan amendment will bring the property into compliance with the Pennington County Zoning Ordinance under that plat. The applicant intends to sub subdivide the property into four separate lots and will not, and the current zoning will not meet the requirements as a property sits today. Uh, existing conditions. Uh, <coughs> Property is zoned General Agriculture District consisting of 12.83 acres. Access is off Old Hill City Road. There's no special flood hazard area on the property. No structures on the property. However, there is a conventional wastewater treatment system from a former residence that was placed there. This is what the subdivision will, uh, proposed subdivision will look like. Current zoning within one mile includes General Agriculture District, Limited Agriculture District, Low Density Residential District, the City of Hill City Limits, as well as Highway Service District. Future land use within one mile includes Public Land, Planned Unit Development Sensitive District, Low Density Residential District, to the City of Hill City Limits, as well as Highway Service District. Apologize for that. The applicant the applicant is all, has also requested to change future land use of the subject property from planned unit development sensitive district to low density residential district. There are several properties within one mile of the subject property to include three properties that border the subject property. As you can see on the map here, 
Therefore, the applicant's request appears to be in harmony with current and future land use in the area. And staff is recommending approval of rezone 1917 and comprehensive plan 1917. Thank you, Jason. Chair. Commissioner Drews. Uh, Jason, tell me again, what, what did you say about the uh, sanitary sewage? Uh, there is an on-site wastewater treatment system uh, in place. I believe it's on the proposed lot C, as you can see on the screen. That's here. in use? It's not in use right now. There was a uh, single-wide mobile home on that lot. It okay. Was, it has been removed. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair. Commissioner um, Raskinet. I suppose about 10 years ago, I appraised that property for the owners, and, and there was a double-wide on that or single-wide, but that would... Uh, I know the area, and I think what they're planning on doing is just uh, it's acceptable and in harmony with the surrounding land use, so I'd be in favor of it. We have a motion. I'll make that motion to approve. Motion by Ross Connect. Second. Second by Drews. Um, did the applicant want to speak on this item? It's pretty quick. Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries. Item F, please. Okay, item F is vacation of section line VS 1903 by resolution for Patrick and Marlene Sheely is to vacate a 33-foot wide portion of a 66-foot wide section line right-of-way and overlying portion of the Wallace Street platted public right-of-way. The applicants, Patrick and Marlene Sheely, have requested this in order to bring an existing structure into compliance. As the property consisted, a lot one of Copal Estates subdivision is owned limited agriculture district and consists of 30.66 acres. There's no special flood hazard area on this property and its access is off of the Wallace Street verse via an existing approach. There's a single family residence with a deck addition, some sheds, a dog kennel shops, and some pole barns. A lot two of the Copal Estates is zone limited agriculture district and consists of 16.94 acres. There is no special flood hazard area on this property. Um, there is a pole barn um, structure on that property. There was a building permit pulled for this in 2008. Um, it was to have living quarters in it uh, with an on-site wastewater treatment system, but as the property stands today, it's just a pole barn structure. Um, so just a little history on this property. Um, there was a building permit that had been submitted to our office um, for a shop building to the south of that existing shop building. And during that um, review of that building permit, it was found that the existing shop building was encroaching into the setbacks and therefore the section line and Wallace Street right of way. Um, the applicants did submit a setback variance to the Board of Adjustment back in May of 2019 and at that time um, the Board of Adjustment had directed them to work with staff to get the and vacate the section line right-of-way and um, Wallace Street right-of-way. So this is where we are today. Um, the petition, there are petition requirements uh, for the vacation of a section line in Wallace Street right-of-way. Um, there was 417 signatures um, collected. This was verified by our auditor's department. Um, this was routed through our interdepartmental review process and there were some concerns. Um, the highway department was opposed for uh, vacating the section line right of way. Um, the city of Rapid City was opposed um, to vacating the section line right of way. Um, just a point of clarification, this property is in the city of Rapid City through the mile planning jurisdiction. Um, staff did perform a site visit on the subject property, and there is the pole barn, um, and there is a propane tank, and it appears to be a retaining wall also that is encroaching approximately 9.9 .9 feet um, into the right-of-way. Um, that was verified through a survey from Fisk Land Surveying. Um, staff is not making a rep recommendation. However, if the Board of Commissioners chooses to approve this vacation, we recommend six conditions. Thank you. Um, property owner first. And just state your name, sir. Oh, up here, sir. Come on up. <laughs> I'm Pat Sheely. Morning. Good morning. 
just um, tell us how long you've been working on the property, sir, um, why you vacated the section line, um, 33 feet, um, anything you know with encroachments and anything else you'd like to tell us about this property? Well, we went to add a second building next to that one and uh, been working on it since last May, actually before that March. and. Uh, we uh, realized or found out that that building, even though it would have been permitted before, was encroaching. <coughs> so that's why we asked for the section line so we wouldn't have to tear the front off the building and move it back. Okay, any questions, board? Sir. Commissioner no. LaCroix. <coughs> so this original building did have a, a permit, construction permit pulled, and it, you did everything that you thought? We hired a contractor and he got pulled the permit, we paid for it, and yeah. Okay. That's what I wanted to know. The first building, the second building is the same thing. Same thing. a different contractor to build the second building. Okay. Madam Chair. Commissioner Drews. Uh, Mr. Sheely, I, I know, and Marlene, your wife may have done this yesterday. Uh, there was a question relative to the an easement uh, for the uh, power cooperative. Do you know if that was resolved? I called them. Uh, we actually are the end of the line. Okay. And uh, I dug the trench to put power into that building with them, that they helped me, and uh, they remembered that we did that. So we're, uh, it's well marked out, and uh, and it's going to share the same service. The second building will share the service with the first building. Okay, are they are they requesting any further easement for in the future? They mentioned yesterday that they just want permission to use it as an easement if they decide to take it further down the line. Okay, and you don't have any objection to that. Not at all, because it's m my building that they'd be putting power sure, to. Sure, there's uh, There's six conditions uh, that are tied to this. A um, couple of them really, um, uh, one, two of them actually involve that utility easement with the cooperative. Uh, there's one thing that you'll have to come back for if we approve this today, uh, and that is we need to come back to the Board of Adjustment in the future uh, for two feet. Yes, sir. And uh, I think that the other um, I have one, is, the final one is just filing with the Register of Deeds, which is not um, not a, a concern. Uh, number four, what was number four on that? Access. <clears throat> so what, what, access? It's a lot two from corporal subdivision. Okay, four. and I don't think that's an issue no. either. So uh, what I'd like to do is to propose a, um, a motion uh, for condition one that changes the wording a little bit from what the commission has. And uh, am I free to do that at this point? Or? Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to move that the uh, vacation of section line and Wallace Street right away include the eastern 33 feet of cul-de-sac portion of the right away adjoining lots one and two of Copal Estate subdivision located in the southwest quarter of section 14 as shown in exhibit A1. And are you leaving, sir, the rest two, three, four, five, and six the same? Uh, yes. Okay. So that would be a motion to approve all, but ch the change would be the right. 33 feet where the 60 by 80 pole barn structure right. was. Okay. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second, second that. Motion by uh, Drew, second by Rosconnect. Discussion? Madam Chair. Commissioner DeSanto. Uh, my only concern is that the highway department uh, concern that that road could need to be continued. Your mic mark a little bit. Oh. Uh, my only concern is A, that the highway department uh, is, is concerned that that road might be continued south in the future, and this would definitely interfere with that. Uh, being done. Madam okay. Chair, I suggest Joe respond to that. Sorry, Michelle, give us just a sec. Uh, Joe Miller, Pennington County Highway. Uh, yeah, as you know, we're opposed to any vacation of, of section lines. I talked to Gary about this yesterday, but there is, uh, you know, that road, that section line goes south to Murphy Road, mm -hmm. um, which we granted an encroachment or, uh, or a variance whatever I think in December sometime or maybe it was before that but this section line right-of-way can continue on down to Murphy Road which then 
exit out onto Highway 79. Um, and Bill put together a profile sheet going a mile south from this residence here. Um, and the grade changes are, I think, 5% to 5 to 6% up or down, which is very buildable to build a road at least a mile south. Um, with the limited time on the, the research of this, um, we didn't go any further than that, but I don't know exactly how far that is to Murphy Road. Thank you, Joe. But it Michelle? Is, oh. Sorry. Michelle Hoffman, State's Attorney's Office. I, I first, for the benefit of the board, need to just point out some legal issues and then tag team on what Joe said because I think there is an alternative solution. Uh, first of all, there is a concern with regards to the sufficiency of the petition that was circulated because it did not identify the section line as being vacated, only the Wallace Street platted right away. Second of all, um, under a Supreme Court decision, South Dakota Supreme Court decision, um, governing bodies have no power or authority to vacate public streets for a purely private purpose or for the purpose of giving the exclusive use of the street to private individuals for their use in strictly private business. And that gets back to the requirement uh, that this board must find that it's uh, with that vacating the right of way is in the public's interest, not just a private individual's interest. But with regard to a potential solution is this. We know the structure's there due to no fault of the Sheelys. Uh, it's encroaching in the right of way. Um, in the event this board was to vacate, there is a statute that actually allows us to reestablish that section line right away. Um, at that time, the Sheelys would have to remove their structure at their cost under the statute. It's so obviously, if that's 40 years from now, that's kind of hard on maybe a subsequent purchaser, two, three um, purchases down the road. I believe that, and I'd have to, I, there's one legal issue I want to look into, but I believe we would be able to enter an encroachment agreement with that this variance application could be denied. We could enter an encroachment agreement with the Sheelys that acknowledge that that structure is there, that we're not going to require removal of that structure at this time, and that in the future, if the section line needed to be developed, and this gets back to a solution Joe's came up that proposed, the Sheelys could either attempt to buy additional property to, to the other side of the road, if they're not able to, do, to accommodate that needed uh, future roadway, if they're not able to do that, then in that event, they would be required to move the structure at their cost. But the benefit of that encroachment agreement is to be filed with the Register of Deeds and that any subsequent purchasers would, in fact, have notice uh, of, of the fact that that structure is within that right away. So you said if it's in the public interest, <coughs> the public interest wouldn't, I believe, in, a, in this right away want a propane tank and a, a uh, building in its in its path, let alone they're going to need a. Um, so you said they could vacate that section line if it was in the public's interest. The Number two, hold on. Okay. Number two, this has been going on since May. That language that that they just went through and paid a lot of money to get those signatures, those were made by the planning commission. They got that from from Cassie. So there's been there's been a few things with this property that. It, it it dumbfounds me. Number one, they called me on this property because they were having issues with trying to figure out what to do with it. And then it was supposed to go to the state's attorney for three months. This was back in what, October, Gary, that you went and visited with me? I no, can't no, remember. That was, that was actually in May. Did not go to okay. the state's attorney's was it in May? office. So um, what was told to them is it was going to be delayed for three months to go to the state's attorney's office. That never happened. Then what happened is we went to visit it the property and found a section line. So we had a meeting and and the person that was doing this property for the planning did not know there was a section line. So then we said, okay, maybe we just vacate the section line. Perfect. Sheely's, me, Gary, all met on this property and then they were told that's what they're gonna do. And that was told by the planning department um, one of the people that were working there, and they gave him the language to do the petition. So now we've had these people since almost a year, it'll be in May, and we've been directing them what to do, and we've been doing, giving the wrong direction. Now we came today again, 
and it's the wrong direction. Because we just met with the planning department and Miss Sheely, and this is what the language they told us, am I incorrect, Gary, to move forward with. Now we come today and we have you telling us something different. Um, I can tell you, um, this, it's not right. I don't know how we make it right, but um, we'd have, in my opinion, if this is not, if this was not done right and it costs people money based on what they were told, um, I, I, I have, I'm dumbfounded. I, I'm, I'm so dumbfounded, I don't even know what to say. And, and they've been more than nice waiting for a pool barn to put another pool barn in the same area. So um, somebody tell me what went wrong and somebody tell me since May, how come it took this long to figure out there was a section line, there was a petition filed, there was time and money that cost these people and it's our fault. I, I can't address what occurred in the planning department. This was just routed to the state's attorney's office for comment on this particular agenda item today. As far, and it is my understanding that the form of the petition was presented to the planning department and approved. Um, that's, that's my understanding as well, but that doesn't change the requirements of the statute. But ultimately it's this board's decision as to how they want to move forward on this agenda item. But I'd also point out in terms of the public interest, the public's interest is in fact having that section line for the development of future roadways as well as utilities. That is the public's interest. Uh, and whether the propane tank or the structure would have to be removed, that's, that's separate from what is in fact the public's interest. And I, I'm only here to adequately inform the board as to what the law is and then ultimately it's your decision how you'd like to proceed but I did oh. highway and I did want to mention that we did believe there was an alternative to that saw you know at least allowed that structure to remain there and keep future landowners aware of the fact that there is an issue with potentially needing to develop Thank that you. section line whether it's vacated or not but one more thing so basically, if we decide of the public interest that that 33 feet needs to be vacated based on our decision of that being built already and what we believe is part of the public interest, we can grant these six conditions, basically because we are vacating it for the public interest. Number two, um, because of that, um, I would ask this board to move forward and, and not give them any more time with us with this planning area to change any of this to something different than it is today because you still have 33 feet to build on on that road and in future if they need to develop that I'm going to guess with common sense they're going to build that road out as well they're going to need that road built out so they're going to help get the road built in the future for the highway department Madam Chair Madam, go ahead Gary Commissioner Drews first uh, I understand where the highway department is coming from. They're going to, they're basically, uh, you know, they're going to oppose the vacation of any section line. And, and uh, uh, generally, I agree with that personally also. But as I was out there and looked at the uh, topography of this land, uh, you know, I'm not an engineer and uh, it may well be able to be built on. But I think uh, if you're actually going to continue that road, you're going to relocate it uh, uh, basically to the west of the uh, current location where that section line is. Uh, I agree uh, with um, uh, Commissioner Adcock. Uh, this actually started, we said May, this actually started, I think Pat said last March. They've been working on this for 10 months. I don't see any purpose uh, of continuing on and doing anything different than what's before us today. So I would also encourage you to uh, support uh, moving forward with this. Madam Chair. Commissioner DeSanto. With what the state's attorney's office has laid out for us here, I understand your concern. I understand your frustration. Uh, my concern is, is that this could get us in trouble in the future. And if, it, it, if I'm understanding Michelle correctly, if this gentleman is not 
able to purchase property to extend the road out across the street from him, um, then we can then we could even be in in more trouble. And it sounds to me like the solution that Michelle came up with, or that the state's attorney's office came up with, is an adequate solution so that he can keep his building, not have to worry about it. And but in the future, which may or may not happen, um, he's protected. Although he, if they decide to develop past him, you're going to have to move your your barn or purchase property. Same, basically the same situation that would happen as if we granted it to him, except for we're not putting ourselves in a pickle. I, I think we are getting in a pickle once we um, change our mind and we had somebody put the wrong description and you had somebody paid to do uh, petitions uh, and get signatures. I think uh, we are in a pickle. Madam I Chair. think we're in a pickle too and maybe we should instead of, of putting ourselves in a further pickle, <laughs> Maybe we should offer to reimburse the costs yeah. that they've incurred because of our mistake. Madam Chair. Commissioner DeLaCroix. Um, Patrick, right? Yes, sir. You've heard the discussion. Yeah. What do you, and first up, I'd like to give you my apologies for what some of the struggles that you've gone through and the commission has. This is, has has been a hot topic for the last six months. With what Michelle said up here, are you okay with the wording that she... No. You're not? No, because what she... I'll just give everybody a quick synopsis. Last March, we applied for a permit. The builder offered a language of... of vacating enough of the easement to make the building that had already been in an approved building permit. I put the building where I was told to. We put it there. And then when they looked at it on the map, they said, oh, it's encroaching. The second building we'd already contracted for, we had offered something similar, but the state's attorney said they couldn't get to it for three months. Nothing really happened after three months. We called Miss Hancock and she said, we got to get on this. And so for someone to suggest that I go buy more land to create 33 more feet of easement, Ziegler owns the land next to me. Hanson owns the ha land behind me. I've offered to buy that land every year since the first year we moved here. So we would have that, just like you've said through all of these other hearings, protect our view and pay for it. Uh, I've paid for a hell of a lot of view out there, folks. And I've paid taxes, I think 20 some thousand a year on it. I'm okay with that. but. That road going down that way, I have to use a bulldozer to clear it to get to that back land already. So I am an engineer and I am a contractor and I've built bridges and highways and now I build VA hospitals or I build improvements to VAs. That isn't the right place for the land. It needs to be shifted over, like Mr. Drew suggested. There's 99 feet minus this 33 left over. There's still 99 feet to build the road. The access to that back property is not, this isn't the most efficient access. The most efficient access is off of Neck Hill. But if someone were to develop that land, then that 99 feet would still give you room for the 66 foot center line to center line. So I think from my perspective, I don't, I, I know Ziegler won't sell me any land. He's a nice man and he's a good neighbor, but he's buying land, he ain't selling it. And if I went and suggested that he sell me a 25 foot slice, he'd probably, say no <laughs> mr patrick i appreciate your i'm sorry that. professionalism <laughs> you, you you answered my question and very elegantly you can tell you're an engineer patrick i i just oh, that's what i wanted to hear to make my decision so you, you're not okay with that you were what's in front of you because the work you did yeah correct i don't want to tear the building down either. okay uh, Patrick, could you explain to me where where the the 99 feet comes from? Well, there's there's a, the easement on each side is 33 feet, right? And 66. then there's the this the section line is 33 feet, so that's 66 on each side. Okay. So that means that 66 times two is 120, right. 132 feet. Yeah. If I take 33, that still leaves you three 33s, which is 99. Okay. To build a road on, you okay. just you just have to offset it to where the road starts on the section line and builds that way, 
and then this side the section line and easement remain 33 feet that I that I leave wide open okay that makes sense to me Joe uh, point of clarification the section line right-of-way is 66 feet 33 feet from either side not a hundred right but there's an easement as well of 33 feet we're right now we're I, six, that building is 66 feet off the off the center line of the of the property boundary. I guess I wasn't aware of any easement yeah we have two we have that building 66 feet from the fence so if we get a 33 foot easement there's still 33 feet and the fence is the middle of what would be the new roadway in my mind and then an easement yeah there's still an easement on his side. he's got the easement. same easement I do he's got 30 the easements in four pieces there's 33 on on each side for the section line that's 66 feet and then there's 33 more for the the right of or the easement so there's an easement and a section line on that particular line Otherwise, we wouldn't be here because I'm getting some questions in people's I'm 66 faces. 66 feet off of that fence right now. That the face of that building is 66 feet. So the 25 foot, it's nine feet into the easement if you measure. So it, so there's it's 59 feet off the center line. So you're saying, sir, that you got the 66 foot section line. Yes, sir. And then a 33 foot easement here, and a 33 foot easement there. That's academic because my pole marks 66 feet off the fence and they've told me that my building is in the, and again, the building's on a, on a permit. I mean, I, and I know I have rights, but I'm not, I'm not that kind of person. I don't need to fight and I, I just want to work it out, but buying more land and, and, and then try and sell the land with, with that kind of a wart on it would be hard. So the bottom line, can you, Joe, can you still build a road That's on, the on probably. that I mean, 33 feet? He's vacating 33 out of 66. Can you build a road at 33 feet and and on that property if and it's still public right away? So you can come back as well and say, you know, because he's going to have, a, he already has a road there. So it's, I believe if you're going to, someone builds a road that he has a vacation, he's going to say, no, you can't build a road right there to my property, you know, I just have I have a hard time thinking that we vacate it that he wouldn't build a road there for his access for later. Well, that 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 line is is 33 feet on my side. There's still 66 feet on the Ziegler side. Actually, it's 30. It's 66 feet, and you're in the one 33 oh, it's, feet. It's, it's twice that. Now. that I'll let Bill okay. talk here. Uh, Bill Well, County Highway Engineer, um, the line right here is the section line. And there's 33 feet to the right-of-way line, which right. is 9.9 .9 feet into the building. Right. There's 33 feet on the other side, and that's the total amount of right-of-way, 66 feet. There is no other no easy land for... Uh, I measured from the fence <coughs> to my building, and it's 59 feet. Well, they're measuring fence from... Fence could be wrong. The fence doesn't necessarily... Fence was surveyed twice. Well, here's the survey. Okay, guys. Bottom line is, okay, um, we have a motion on the floor. Did anybody have a... Um, was there a motion? Yep. Yes. Motion. Okay. Oh, yeah, yours were approved. Okay. okay. Is there a substitute motion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Nay. Um, motion granted, four ayes, one no. Thank you. You will need to come back to the Board of Adjustment for, for that two piece. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Or, Thank you, Pat. Uh, Thank okay. you. I think Marlene's been here enough now. Marlene, you could become a county commissioner too. <laughs> Thank you for your folks' time and your your patience with our planning. Um, Brittany did find that solution. Um, the person that was here at the time, um, we had a few issues, but um, Brittany, thank you for you and your staff for um, helping this and with this motion today. You're welcome. And they do have the timeline. I did send them an email yesterday because uh, there is a waiting period, that 20-day waiting period, so they can get the um, setback bearings on calendar right after that. Okay, thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. Madam Chair, I just want to point out to the Sheelys, I didn't vote no because I'm against what you guys are trying to do. I'm maybe not clear on all of the details because um, there seemed to have been some confusion there. So just so you know. Thank you, Mark. Madam Chair. I suggest the commissioners take a class on section line right away, vacation, and relocation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Brittany, oh. item G. So item G, uh, we just need to schedule a hearing before the Board of Commissioners to review the comprehensive plan, view to 2040. 
um, you guys went through and made your comments and changes um, at the last hearing, I believe that was in mid-December. Uh, so those changes are being worked on right now um, by Matrix, um, Rick Rust. And the, once the document is um, updated with your guys' changes, there are going to be some red lines. But it is going to go back to Planning Commission just for one more approval and then to you guys for approval. So, Ms. Um, Brittany, you need some a meeting done in March? Do you yes, have a, a meeting date. Um, the Planning Commission is going to hear it on Monday, February 24th, 2020 at their regular, regularly scheduled Planning Commission meeting. Okay. Um, I do believe uh, that there's two meetings in March, um, March 3rd and, and March 17th. Ms. Holly, do you have a suggestion for the board? Um, I looked at your schedules. Either one should be acceptable as long as advertising deadlines have been met. Mm -hmm. okay. So tell me those two dates one more time, Ms. Brittany. A March 3rd or a March 17th? Which are both regular commission meeting dates anyway. Yeah. Okay. I say we get it done on the 3rd. Everybody okay with the 3rd? Yep. yep. Okay. March 3rd. And a motion to that effect, please. Um, second. Moved by Drew, second by DeSanto on March 3rd for the review of the Comprehensive Plan 2040. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brittany. Ms. Holly. All right. Commissioners, per your bylaws and rules of procedure, we are to review them every January. Um, I went ahead and did that. I'd be more than happy to go through the minor changes that I made, or I will just stand for questions. Please go ahead and go through the minor changes that you made. Okay. Um, table of contents is simply updated to reflect new page numbers. If you go to page nine mm -hmm. in the document, the law for executive session changed in the 2019 session to allow a sixth reason to go into executive session. So I just updated that to reflect the reason, um, which is to discuss protection of private property, emergency management plans, things like that. Um, so I updated that to reflect the current statute. Okay, very good. Um, on page 10, I realized that I was not necessarily in compliance with section 4.8 in how it was worded. Um, when there's a gap in scheduling before you guys hit the 10.30 uh, planning commission, sometimes I move item uh, like vouchers and items from the chair and public up before planning starts to fill that time. Um, according to this, I probably wasn't supposed to be necessarily doing it that way. So I changed the wording just to say instead of I should, it typically happens in this order. And then a new statement that says, if the typical structure of the meeting presents a timing challenge, commission staff may move the order of agenda items to accommodate others. Okay. So other than that, I think the only other two is that I did not spell the word publicly correct. And so I changed that. Okay, good enough. Thanks, Holly. So we're just looking for a Move motion for approval. to approve so the moved. amended changes. Moved by LaCroix. Second by DeSanto. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> Ms. Holly, thank you for all your work um, that you do every day for us. Absolutely. And uh, this work um, that you have to go through, some of our stuff um, <laughs> that needs to be changed, uh, we couldn't do it without you, Ms. Holly. So Appreciate thank you uh, for all your work. Next is item B, if I'm correct. A, 19. Sorry, I'm in the wrong spot here. Sorry. 19A, items from chair and commission members. This is Commissioner LaCroix. Sorry, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair. What this is, is I'm looking for a motion to approve uh, payment to Old West Dutch Catering for catering services provided for the March 2020 Black Hills Area of County Commissioners annual meeting from uh, commission budget and it could be up to three, 300. We don't know yet exactly. But what, what's happening is we're, we're hosting the Black Hills Area County Commissioners meeting uh, in emergency 911 and being able to provide tours 
of our facility and of uh, the care campus as needed and we're setting it up. We swap places with uh, Lakota, uh, Oglala, Lakota. Oglala, Lakota. They were supposed to host it. They're gonna do it next month. Um, this is gonna be our annual uh, appointments of the officers meeting also, but it, I think it gives a great opportunity to be able to share this with our surrounding counties. Um, Normally we charge ten dollars for the meals for everybody. We we just couldn't find it in that budget. We actually were trying. Where was it, Ollie? The uh, Mount Rushmore Historical Society. The Historical Society. We had looked at that, but there was a charge there. So in order to save costs, we had an EOC, and it kind of worked out better that we could uh, do the tours and kind of make a little bit more out of these Black Hills Area County Commission meetings than just. Uh, the meeting and the discussions, but also make them into a learning experience. Um, that's what we're talking with with Ogala Lakota in our next meetings too. But there's going to be a cost overrun, and I think it's well worth our commission's time and efforts to be able to to absorb that if we need to uh, to be able to showcase what we have here. Do we have a discussion or a motion on this board? We're basically just looking for a motion to approve the caterer to allow the treasurer to pay, or I'm sorry, the auditor to pay whatever it's up to. Um, <laughs> but it will be offset by revenue. So, yes. Miss Holly. <laughs> uh, what she's saying is she's excited and she's going to tell you about it. <laughs> well, and we don't want a dollar amount in the motion. I guess that was my point. Is okay. I don't want you to put a dollar amount. We're just going to pay for the whole thing and offset it and receive the revenues back in. I make a motion that we approve for payment. Motion by Drews. Second. Second by Ross Connect. Any discussion? Madam Chair. Mr. Just, Drews. Just follow up a little bit with what Lloyd has had to say. I think in the, the past years, they've charged each individual person coming. And I think this district, uh, which I think comprises 14 counties, mm -hmm. goes from the North Dakota border to the Nebraska border, uh, that they chose uh, a couple of years ago maybe to uh, the hosting county would pay the cost of the, of the meal. And so that's where this comes about. I would highly encourage uh, all of the commission uh, to attend this, uh, especially since it's gonna be right in our backyard. We do have fairly good representation from other elected officials at those meetings. Uh, Cindy and Janet are both here. Uh, they attend on a regular basis. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to think if uh, Kevin has been there on several occasions. Kevin's been asked to speak on several occasions too. So, uh, Barry, so uh, it, it's, very informative as to what's going on within our entire area as far as counties are concerned, not only from the commission level, but from the other elected officials um, also. So that's all I got. I'll Thank you. We do Madam have Chair. a, go ahead. I'll just piggyback on what Gary, because he makes a good point. You know, when we first got on this, they're rotating them from county to county, so we all get a good experience of what the other counties, where they're at, what they're doing. And, uh, that is the good, best part about uh, rotating areas. Thank you, Commissioner uh, LaCroix. We do have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, motion carries. Next is Gallagher, Gallagher Wage Study Recommendations. Move to dissolve compensation committee and instruct the HR director to complete all compensation related duties for Pennington County with final review and approval of HR recommendation by board. Um, and Did you make that as a motion? Sure. I'll second it. So we have a motion and a second. Motion by Hadcock, second by Drews. And then it is further moved to schedule a special meeting um, for 9 a.m. wage study presentation at GBS. Um, discussion, sure. please. Mr. Drews. I just, I think the, uh, the, the compensation committee, I think most of those are responsibilities that have been falling under the compensation committee really belong uh, to uh, HR director. And so, and I, and I think that he has the ability that if he needs advice uh, from time to time relative to particular issues, that he has that authority to go out and, and seek out advice from whatever appropriate departments it may be. So that's why I think that the, the responsibilities of this committee 
uh, probably served a purpose, uh, a good purpose at the time that it was established. But I think that time has been long gone at this point in time. So that's why I'm supporting this. Thank you. And the second part of this is we had some discussion. There's a health care trust board and that some of the, the discussion that was with compensation uh, committee could be combined together uh, on that board and then um, look at revising the health care trust board and what their uh, duties are instead of having two different committees on this. So just so you know, we're just not dropping one and giving no voice. Um, we need to figure out on the health care trust board with the members um, what basically the makeup needs to be. And <coughs> we're just doing a little bit of revision that makes not two committees, but one. And it's been suggested by some of the staff that we revise it into uh, basically taking out the compensation committee and uh, revising the health care trust board. Ms. Janet. Good morning, commissioners. Janet Saylor, treasurer. I just want to give you a little history on uh, both the compensation committee and the health care trust board. Um, I've been on the health care trust board for 20 some years and the board was established when we went to um, self-insurance because of everything that we had to go to writing up the policies, um, the definitions of everything, uh, the retirement issues that we were facing when we had more than one person that worked for the county. We had people that worked in the sheriff's office, people that worked um, for the jail, how to set that up. So while I'm not opposed to you disbanding the compensation committee, I think that the reason, and let, let me go back, the compensation committee was also set up because every time something would come up and someone would have a different opinion on something, it would have to come to this board. And we would spend hours presenting something to the board and then the board would have to look at it and think about it and then it would have to come back again in two weeks. The compensation committee is a good committee. Um, I think we still need to have that. We can combine it in the health care trust board, but there's things out there when it comes to compensation that we need to look at in the big picture. One of the things that we had just recently was employees wanting three days for snow and they just wanted a payment. Just give me three days. Well, that was discussed at the compensation committee. The reason for that is because a lot of employees use their vacation the day they get it. They, they never plan ahead, they never save for anything. Well, when we got to discussing it, it everyone, some of them would say it's not gonna cost the county money. Yes, it is gonna cost the county money because you can't give two or three snow days to me as an employee with pay and forget that you have sheriffs, highway, 911. If you're going to give three days to someone else, you have to compensate those 24 hour people. So I'm not speaking for everyone. There's other people that are here, but I think to do, disband the compensation committee and not have any discussion is wrong. But I will go with whatever the commission decide. Thank, Ma thank you. Madam Chair. Hold on a sec, we're gonna hear their public comment. Lloyd and then we'll go ahead. Um, anybody else like to speak? Morning again, Commissioner Cindy Muller, Pennington County Auditor. I would just agree with Janet. I think that to have that input from the department heads and the elected officials when those policies are maybe brought forward and changed is really important because even though John is great at what he does with HR, I think every department has different scenarios that happen in their office. And I think for all of us to come together and to be able to discuss those is very important. Thank you. Now, Commissioner Corey. Thank you. <clears throat> you know, when I first picked up my agenda and I seen this on there Saturday morning when I was going through it, that's the first I heard of dis the disbanding uh, of the compensation. I got involved with the compensation committee me meeting a couple years ago back when the chair had requested that a commissioner start attending them. I did that. And I'm thankful I did because I it was I learned quite a bit of what was going on in our community, our our facilities, and the last work that we did took a lot of work, a lot of effort that was presented to this board of commission, and if it wouldn't have been for 
they're talking and they're working through what was presented a year and a half ago, we as a commission would be going into special sessions, making special meetings to deliver because we still they still end up having to go back in and change it. One comment I heard on the back side was that the, the compensation committee meeting is too big, too cumbersome, getting too many people in it. A smaller group would be more efficient. I agree with that. I, 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 so when I when I heard this, I'm thinking I'm not in support of eliminating it, making it a smaller, more efficient group, uh, because our, the makeup of our county is quite different than any local governments or business. We have elected officials, we have different departments, and I think they all need to have a voice in what happens, and you need to get buy-in from everybody to move forward. Not everybody has to agree, but at least some buy-in and discussion. I, I totally believe that uh, our society is going into emails and texts, and and 90% of our communication is done that way, and it's 90% of it's right wrong. And so to be able to say that HR may be able to communicate and get opinions through emails, everybody reads them a little bit different, gets worked up. I would be support, <coughs> not support the motion on the floor because I think what needs to be happened is that we need to identify that there is going to be a smaller group where it's going to go. Uh, what we need to identify would come to that committee. I mean, simple policy changes in the handbook and so forth, uh, I think can be done in emails and so forth and discussions. But I, I, I just really don't want to eliminate the other department's uh, voice in some of the decisions that happens. And, and I do believe, as, as Janet said, the reason why the compensation committee was made up is because uh, to save the commission time from going over and over and over and over stuff, these people get into a room and they may have their discussions, have open discussions. Uh, they don't always all have to agree, but then they bring that forward, and then I guarantee you the commission's going to not all agree on what what that is too. But at least it's been vented uh, through the administration of everybody involved. So if, if this is going to, if the goal is to uh, downsize it to make it more functional, I'm in support of it. Or if there's a motion to move it to the healthcare and re uh, decide what needs to be discussed and so forth. I think that needs to be included in the motion, not just totally dissolve and then we'll work, work on it later. I think we need to, needs to be involved in the motion. Yeah, Madam Chair. I, uh, I would reflect almost exactly what Lloyd is saying. I, I think that uh, what Janet pointed out is dead on. Um, and I think that each, at least each department head uh, needs to be involved in in this uh, compensation decisions uh, because they're the closest to the subject that they're that we're addressing of anyone um, closer than than John and closer than us and so uh, to take that away from them would not I don't believe would be appropriate at all so I think that we need to I think that where Lloyd is going with just making it a smaller group so that it's more efficient is a much better idea. Um, and then that group comes to a decision and then if we have difficulty with that, then we can further discuss it. But um, maybe EHR director, the department head, and a, and a commissioner um, making the, the initial making up the compensation committee or as Janet said move it into the health care trust board thank you Madam chair you know based on the testimony that I've heard today um, I'm gonna have to go with uh, Lloyd and Mark I it's pretty obvious that uh, this isn't the time to do that I'm not saying there's a time to do it's not coming down the road but until I hear more testimony I would have to uh, hold off on dissolving the compensation committee. I totally agree that it needs to be downsized and more efficient because the ones that I've been to, and I'm not, that's not my strong point, competition or compensation, but uh, it gets a little confusing sometimes. Thank you. 
when we decided to um, eliminate this, um, we listened to Gallagher. We also, um, I'm listening to department heads and commissioners that would be hard to communicate before we get to here. You'd have to, you'd have to communicate here instead of in a meeting. Um, that's not true. You can all call John. You can all department head meet John. As a commissioner, you could still meet John. Smaller groups are still going to eliminate some of you, so you'd have to do it anyway. Um, having a voice, I don't care what department has, you always have a voice. All you have to do is communicate to the other person. 20 years ago, we did not have an HR person. We have a comparable, very comparable, or whatever you call that word. Um, we hired him to do this job. Now we're saying committeeum. Joe, we need 10 people to make sure on your committee that Joe is spending millions of dollars and affecting employees that we need a committee. Um, some of those committees are committees that um, by law you have to have. We made this also because we didn't have, I believe, a very good HR man. I believe the, the department heads and the commissioners can still have that same voice with a man that knows how to do his job. So I'll keep saying, everybody try to do their job with a committee. Um, it's not good. It's very hard. And if we hired him for that price, and we even hired him for a higher price because he was very good at his job, why you have him? Pay him $50,000 and let a committee do it for him. Um, I'm just saying, um, if he makes changes, if he makes different ideas that people disagree with, call him, just like we have to for their departments. Otherwise, let's let him do his job. We had talked about this before in um, other things that we have talked about, about letting John do his job. Now we're saying, okay, um, he needs help. He needs 10 committee members or three committee members of, it looks like we would have to have department heads and committees. Well, you can restructure compensation committee. You can put some of this information into department head meetings. And when it comes to us, this is our job to go and discuss it. And if there is problems before then, we don't bring it forward. What we do is we say we need information. Holly will be like, we don't, we don't have a uh, basically a group of people that's going to move this. John's going to know not to move things forward if Janet and and uh, Cindy um, don't want to move forward. So we ex we like the the history on things, but you still have a man you could communicate to. To have to be a part of it, you still are having a voice. You still ha are having the same thing, except you're going to the man himself instead of him having to hash it out with all 10 of you in the room, trying to figure out what's the common voice in this, this situation, bring it forward. That's very hard as a department head, let alone a commissioner to do. So that's why this was, there's still room for a health care trust board we had talked about that we could put some of the things that maybe on this compensation committee needed to be put on trust board, but we can bring the trust board committee next forward and then say, okay, these things, once we vetted this because we eliminated the compensation committee, Barry says, well, I think this should still be on there. And, and we work with John with the department heads and bring that forward. So we're eliminating this committee and he's not having to go to two different committees trying to fill his voice uh, and make a decision um, that he can do behind the scenes, meaning um, with the department's heads and the people that we are concerned about. So that's, that's why this was gonna be dissolved. And then, like I said, um, we had talked to the sheriff and he was in agreement as well. And, and I thought the department heads he had talked to that we would move some of the issues with John's voice um, to um, healthcare trust board. Um, just to make sure some of the things that were being uh, vetted were done or Miss Holly had said we could move them to some of the things that John had concerns or the department had concerns, department heads had concerns with, we could make into department head meetings. So there was other solutions and that's why 
we were just weren't saying, okay, we're done with compensation. Don't worry about it, guys. You're never going to have your voice again, and this is done. Um, it's to let a guy do his job, and then anything that we believed as department heads, go to the department head meeting and say, okay, these are the things that are our concerns. Let's put it in a different committee, um, meaning the trust board. So um, just so you're all in the understanding, it's not eliminating everything. It's eliminating some of the stuff with Gallagher's study that um, he could do. He's very capable of doing, and I uh, believe he should be able to do, my opinion. Ma'am. John, Chair. if you'd like to speak. I just, I just want to go on record that none of us, and I think I can speak for the other department heads that are sitting in here, have said that John is incompetent as an HR director. I want that to be on the record. Okay. That never came out of anybody's mouth. And like I said previously, we... We understand that you want to make the comp committee and the health care trust board all one committee because it's all under compensation. That's fine. We're not disagreeing with the talk that you had with Kevin. But at one point, we were a small committee. And because some of the um, departments weren't being represented in it, that's why the committee was expanded, just so that everybody is aware why it went from small to large. But please, no one said that our HR director is not capable of doing his job or that he's and incompetent. And Janet, I didn't say he was I, incompetent. I, I said that he was, he was competent of doing his job without 10 committee members, not that he's incompetent. So, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing okay. with you, but okay, just the way so we're you on said it, page. I just want it for the record that okay. that wasn't anybody's intention at all. Okay. Okay? Thank you, Ms. Janet. Ms. Holly. I'm going to throw my two cents in as well. Um, commissioners, I support the motion that's on the floor to dissolve it. I truly think that you have a tremendously underutilized resource sitting right over there. John knows his stuff. John communicates very well with departments. I'm concerned that we have three commissioners sitting there that are thinking that the departments don't have a voice. Um, John is a meeting guy. He will be the first one in your office when he has a question. We have department head meetings that things can be vetted through. John has the ability to call a department head meeting if he so chooses through me um, to vet these things. I believe department heads have the ability to come in front of you when it's time to give their voice. The comp committee is a recommending body. They don't make any decisions. They don't have that authority. It's you. And so I truly believe that there are more efficient and effective ways to handle those types of issues. And, and you're not utilizing an amazing resource that you have in front of you in the most efficient way. Um, there's a lot of taxpayer dollars sitting in a compensation meeting. And, and it's like anything, sometimes the process that gets dragged out. And I think by funneling it to the HR director who should be doing those types of functions, I think things could be handled more efficiently. Thank you. So, thank you. She said that more eloquently, Miss Janet. <laughs> <laughs> and I apologize. But I was <laughs> and I love you, Janet. Um, Miss John. <laughs> eloquently, that's a good word, too. <laughs> morning, Commissioners of John Morrow, Pennington County Human Resources. So, when this was first um, brought as an option, I guess, I, I was curious. Um, I will say that in the past with my work history, I've been through two compensation reviews and restructures in the past. One with my most recent employer, one with the employer before. Um, what complicates that is when you have a number of people who aren't professionally trained in compensation methods, in analysis, reviews, but they have very strong opinions about what they feel is right and that their teams are special. Uh, and I'm not diminishing in any way the value of the people we have working for Pennington County, trust me. We have some tremendous, tremendous people. But there truly are set values for each position. What happens at the point we get into a compensation committee review, there's none of those things being done scientifically or with any approved process. It's all done by emotion and who we've been able to persuade to our side of the discussion. That said, the goal here is to hire 
and put in place a, a competent person to not only handle it internally, but selection of a vendor externally, which we had a number of people decided that that would be fair. I went back through the data I could find from the last compensation study. The same concerns that are being raised now were also concerns that were raised with that study. And unfortunately, they were persuasive enough that they changed the ratings for a number of those positions. That's created some of the same issues that we have today. Some of the, the structures don't make sense. Some of the positions don't make sense. Some of them are being paid values that are over and above what the market would normally pay. That happens when you have people that aren't professionals in compensation actually helping make those decisions. I meet with the department heads almost daily. There's always a stream of people coming into my office. If I don't see them in person, I go to their offices or I call them, or in some cases, Commissioner LaCroix, I do send emails. But communication is, is probably my strong suit when it comes to being in this role. When I visited with um, Mr. Goldberg from Gallagher, his recommendation was that this be an HR process. The compensation committee distorts, if you will, the value of having a vendor come in and actually do these reviews. We're paying this, this firm almost $80,000 to tell us what we need to hear, not necessarily what you want to hear about some of the jobs. That's a huge investment. And if we don't do it right, then we will be right back in the same pickle, I like that word from earlier, um, that we have been for the most recent few years. Because then you run into these situations where people are paid unfairly. Some aren't paid enough, some are paid too much. How do you bring a balance to that? And we get together with the comp committee, there's a lot of great discussion. Unfortunately, it's difficult to achieve any kind of consensus because you've got everybody pulling for their people. If you can take that out of that environment and put it into an environment where it's being done unbiased manner, fair manner, consistent manner, and we're applying the same rules for evaluations of all of these positions, that's the only way you can actually have a program that makes sense and where everybody will be paid fairly based upon the qualifications for their job and the longevity or time that they've been in those positions. That's part of the recommendation from Gallagher. You see a few of the forms that Mr. Um, um, Goldberg sent as well. The process to actually appeal the ratings that they've determined are appropriate. The process of creating new positions that people feel we need to have internally. There's an evaluation process. I should have brought his book. We have one book. It's about two and a half inches thick. That's the DBM process, the decision ban method process of assigning values and ratings to jobs. That's not something that a whole board of people are going to be competent with or even be interested in reading, to be honest. It's, it's data about evaluation processes where you evaluate different components of positions to make sure they're being evaluated fairly and consistently so you can actually have a structure that makes sense and they can be defense or defendable. Um, when we look at this, even as we've gone through the process since last March and April when we first initiated the review, we have 23 new positions that have been proposed by the department heads that are in the audience today and or others that weren't able to attend. Those have already been rated by Gallagher for inclusion. The process in the past would have looked like, okay, well, I want to start this job. We'd sit around the table and say, well, what do you think it's like? Well, here's where I think it needs to be. And then we'd all take votes and it, it's, Unfortunately, it comes down to almost a popularity type of vote. Yeah. Whoever has been most persuasive in that situation to create those new positions, well, we think they need to be paid here. Some of the people in the audience today have had extra calls with Gallagher to discuss their concerns about or their thoughts about some of the positions that they think are rated unfairly. I don't, I don't devalue that or I don't believe that that was wrong. Unfortunately, they still don't agree with the ratings in those positions. Again, we hired a firm that specializes in doing this. None of us here, myself included, have the experience they do to actually make those determinations. Yet we want to throw that out 
to have the, the process be the comp committee make those adjustments. To me, that doesn't make sense. If we're not giving the citizens of the county, we're not giving the employees of the county due diligence to make sure we have a fair and consistent process to actually do that. Is this truly an HR function? Yeah, it is. When I visited with some of my peers across the upper Midwest, they all were questioning how and why we had a compensation committee. This is very unusual. Is there a value in still meeting and gathering that data? Yes. And I'm not proposing, I wouldn't support eliminating those conversations. That has to happen, especially as we review the, the job changes that technology brings or the demands of our citizens bring to us. As those things evolve, so does the way we actually evaluate and apply value to those positions. But again, for a committee of you know, 14, 15 people in a room, to make that decision is unfair to the employees and it's unfair to the process. Um, so again, I, I speak on behalf of the motion. Um, I would support the motion to actually do that. I would, however, caution against saying that those things would be transferred into the benefit of the healthcare trust. That truly is about healthcare benefits. And I think that's a different duck than what this process <laughs> is. I would encourage you to support this motion um, I would also commit personally, um, it wouldn't change my interactions with those departments. I still need their feedback. I still need to know what their people are doing. I learn more about the county every day from the very same group that I need to get that information from. They help me be better at what I do. Um, but the compensation committee isn't the method to make that happen. So, Madam Chair. Uh, I stand for Mr. questions. Drews. Question, John. Yes, sir. Uh, I have before me the notes relative to the uh, department head meetings. Yes, sir. Uh, are, is that an appropriate time for any of these discussions? <clears throat> I believe it is. I was chastised slightly at a meeting two months ago for bringing a comp committee item to the, the department head meeting. I said, well, it's a comp committee item. Well, it's all, all the department heads are aware because it impacts the people. Um, so that's why I I brought it to that meeting because I think that's the appropriate venue. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because all department heads are invited to. Yes, sir. Is that a monthly? It's a monthly meeting. Okay. Yes. Madam Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Basanti. My biggest concern in agreeing with Lloyd mm -hmm. on his thought process was we've got already two department head people that are concerned about this. You bet. Um, my biggest concern is that those department head heads will not, they need to be included. And you're telling me they will be included. Yes, sir. Um, the point that you make because of some of the decisions we've had to make about emotion is very well taken. Yes, sir. Um, I don't think that emotion should be involved in making compensation decisions either. Uh, looking at the first, uh, I don't know, chart that went out mm -hmm. um, regarding these compensations, I was, I was taken aback by where they placed certain job descriptions sure. comparative to other job descriptions mm -hmm. that I am well aware this job doesn't even come close to the kind of work that this job does, yet they're the same yes, sir. Uh, designation. So that needs to be obviously addressed um, and, and taken care of. But listening to John talk um, leans me more in the direction that this is, this is okay, as long as we are of the understanding that these department heads are involved all the time. And uh, I just don't, I don't want to see a situation where we got depart, department heads um, being left out of a decision when they are the closest um, to that employee of anybody in the entire building. So well, thank you for that, Commissioner. I will say that the department heads collectively, they're my friends. They're not only my peers, but they're my friends. I'm not going to do anything that's going to discredit or harm them in any manner. My goal is to help the county be what it can be based upon all of the things that we have at our disposal. 
I want to make sure that our employees are paid fairly and consistently across the board. I would caution, and I, I fully appreciate your comment about comparing the positions. I would caution you that that's how we got to where we are on some of those positions. However, we can't compare positions against positions. You really do need to look at the criteria and the things that that position does versus what it does compared to someone else. That's where we kind of run afoul of the things that actually bring consistency to the process. I'm saying though that there needs to be a valuation process where we understand fully and can reflect some of those changes. But it has to be about those positions individually and not in comparison to another. Um, so that's part of the compensation review process is it actually makes sure there's consistent criteria that are being used and it's not saying, well, Billy Bob does this and Susie May does this. Gosh, I think they should be paid the same. No, there's very different criteria. Even the job titles that we currently have, and that's part of the structural challenges, I guess, is what we have. For example, we have an office manager in, I think it's six different departments right now. We have three different ratings from, from Gallagher on what they should be paid based upon their current job descriptions. Not all office managers are doing the same type of Absolutely work, not. but we currently have them all on the same grade in our current structure. It doesn't make any sense. So there's a different job code would be evaluated or attached to each one of those positions for every department. So we can differentiate between what they do in the system, in our payroll system, to make sure we can pay them fairly for what they're doing. Um, so that's part of the process. But I, I would not try to exclude, trust me, I need their opinions, especially only being here for two years. I need all of their feedback, their thoughts, their ideas, but I also have to be able to filter out the ones and explain to them why those things are filtered out that can't be applied in that situation. So uh, I do everything I can to make sure it's on the up and up and that it's fair and consistent. So Madam, with everything. Madam Chair. Hold on. Ron Rosconnect. Uh, Madam Chair. So, John, you know, I guess what I'm about as a new commissioner, only a year under my belt, is <coughs> fairness, fairness, yes, sir. transparency, and efficiency. Mm -hmm. If we go this route, which I'm leaning more towards now, I would suggest that in three months, and maybe three months after that, we get everybody together. Absolutely. How's it working, guys? Is it sure. working? And if we could do that so that we'd then we'd have feedback, well, it's working, but we could do this, or it's working, we could do that, but I'd like some follow-up to make sure that, you know, what we decide today is gonna be effective, efficient, and it's gonna allow that transparency that we need between public and uh, employees. No, I, I agree, I think that'd be a wonderful idea. To, an important note, I think, of the three that had concerns with the initial ratings, I am the one that helped encourage them and arrange those meetings with Mr. Goldberg so we could have follow-up discussions on what their concerns were. It's important that we get all that information out that it's all being considered. Um, Janet mentioned earlier the, the snow day situation. That was an agenda item for six months last year. I went back through our meeting minutes. Six of the meetings we talked about snow days and whether we would allow the employees to use their accrued sick time to, to, instead of making them use vacation time or taking the time off without pay. That ended up being approved at the third or fourth meeting, but then we found out there were some complications with Springbrook that didn't allow us to fully implement the approved process because those snow day hours then wouldn't be used to accrue towards overtime. We weren't able to actually identify that as a separate type of pay code so that they could be uh, removed from consideration. So then it came back to the committee again and it ended up being still one of the agenda items that wasn't solved for again at the end of the year. Um, but it had been approved. It, we had it on the minutes. It had been approved. We just couldn't implement again because some of the challenges with our current payroll system. But I just thought that would be uh, an interesting point. So. Thank you, Commissioner LaCroix. Thank you. You know, I, I guess I disagree, John, on some of the stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it is a challenge for you in those meetings sure. to get through some things, but I also look at it as the discussion broadens my horizon because it makes me think of things that I don't uh, haven't thought of before, and that's what I, I I agree with a smaller group. 
I, there's no doubt that that the, the bigger group has a problem, but I think you've got some key people in this room and who's been involved who have some good ideas that can help share. Yes, you're going to call, you're going to stop by, all that stuff, but there's nothing like having five great mo minds in one room, sure. having discussions and talking about what others do. That's my key part with, with this. It, it, I understand nobody's saying that you can't do your job, and I understand with, with Gallagher. I haven't seen the study with the Gallagher yet, but we're seeing it now. You want to bypass this and loosen it <coughs> forward, me. which is may seem small and tedious, but I think we, like I said, the buy-in is my biggest thing. And if we could get the group, I'm more than willing to, first of all, did, has this group, the compensation committee meeting, was this ever presented to them that this was gonna get dissolved? This was a new agenda item actually that was but added this even, past week. They didn't even know this was happening yet? No, I don't believe so, sir. I read it in the minutes myself or in yeah. the agenda. So my suggestion would be is to get presented to that group, have them have some suggestions to what they would like to see, sure. where to go, who, smaller group, and have that discussion. Because I, I imagine they're probably just as much shocked as I was when I read it as they haven't even seen it and it's on the agenda. So that would probably be my suggestion that we can have more discussion. I can't make a motion after speaking, so I... Thank you. Um, Thank you, sir. Madam Chair. I appreciate um, the buy-in, but the buy-in is going to be a committee that's going to decide um, that an HR guy should be on a, or should be a committee or not a committee. Again, um, we're trying to tell you something here. It's based on a motion, um, a lot of time in those, and um, you have still the same voice, the same communication. You're not going to eliminate anybody on that committee at all. They're always going to have a voice, and that's the bottom line. You can have five department heads in the same room. You can have 10 in the same room with that meeting of the minds and get the same thing that you would at a compensation committee. So you're not eliminating any, anything on a compensation committee that John couldn't do without having to have a committee scheduled every time there comes up with an issue. That's got to be tedious as a person running at a department to have to run it through every time in a committee when you could go, okay, the people with the problem, let's have a meeting. Uh, department heads, we have once, once, a, once a month. He can bring that to anybody, 10 department heads at, that, at the meeting for department heads and get anybody with concerns after the meeting and even in the meeting. So um, we're trying to act like we're eliminating voices, but we're not eliminating anybody. And I'll tell you just from issues that I've had with him, um, he's always called me back and we kept communicating and there's always a solution. There's always a good solution, but um, I'm seeing from, John is, is totally right. When we did the last wage study, holy cow, it turned into a mess because you didn't have a HR guy with a voice, you had a compensation and they did change everything. And in the long run, again, we paid a guy $80,000 to give us the advice. He gave us his advice on the HR guy today. He gave us the advice about emotions and different things that happen. Um, if we wanna turn this county around and do it the right way, then let the guy that got hired to um, do it, do his, do his job, because he's trying to tell you something here without trying to be mean. Um, this compensation or this wage study needs to be accomplished with a guy that has the um, know-how to do it and was paid for that know-how to make that decision, just like any other department head on their their areas that they they were hired for. So that's his bottom line I'm listening to right now, and, and uh, he's right. So that's Madam my Chair. opinion. Commissioner DeSanto. I don't disagree with anything you've just said. Um, but I do agree with Lloyd in that if this was the first anybody's heard of it, um, I don't see why there would be an issue. And, I, and I'm not disagreeing with you, Deb, that, that more than likely um, there'll be dissension in, in amongst the 10 or 12 or however many there are. Um, there's going to be some people that are upset, but I think they deserve 
to be at least notified of this before the decision is made. And, and Deb, I've been in business for a long, long time, and, and I know John's got the experience to make these decisions. Um, you know, each department head, it's just like when people go to school and they think they know everything because they were in, because they got their degree, their PhD in, you know, operations accounting or something like that but then they again think they know what what they need to know about Barry Dice's position for example and they don't I get that I get that that's what he went to that's what he got his degree in that's what his position position has been for the last three yeah, decades. jobs that you've had <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm not I'm not disagreeing with you at all but I do think that Lloyd has a very valid point that this needs to be discussed amongst that committee and then voted on after that is done. Thank you, Mark. Um, if I, if the main I thing is, is that um, today is where we vented and they do have a voice. And I've seen two department heads, unless I'm missing anybody that didn't get to speak today, that um, aren't disagreeing. Are we saying that any of the department heads here today um, don't get a voice. Um, so it's been on the agenda. We do it to the public the same way. Oh, that's true. So when the public sees something, they come. They look at the agenda, and then they come here, and they give their voice. So we're saying that um, our agenda is not working for our department heads and our people with a voice today, and they don't get one. We need to go to committee to get their voice. Um, I'm sorry, we don't do we don't do a committee like that for our public. We put it on the agenda, we let people bring their their concerns to it, and then we make a decision. And we so, don't say take that back to that committee unless there's a big idea of okay, there's something wrong here. This guy maybe doesn't know what he's doing. Um, we need to really get that committee's input. Uh, we dissolved it based on facts and information, just like we do anything else on committees or uh, agendas for people that uh, need to come and hear their voice today. So Madam Chair, what you're saying is, is that if they didn't show up today, they probably weren't against this in the first place. I can't say that for sure, but I'm gonna guess there's some department heads here and maybe I'm missing um, some of them today and they're, they're saying that this is not a good idea. So I just wanted... Mr. Guffey or Mr. <laughs> I just have one more thing, so if I could. There's some time sensitivity related to this as well, just so you know. The, the data has been collected. They're finishing up their analysis. They hope to have some data to us by two weeks from now. They want to present to the board, if you will, on March 4th. You still can. Okay. So Thank you. That's the goal. Anyway, I want to share that. Thanks. Thank you. Joe? I just want to point out that myself, I didn't realize that this was a, just looking at the agenda item on the, uh, the agenda without actually going into the, the actual data. Didn't realize that's what it actually was about, is dissolving the compensation committee until my wonderful office manager, Connie, pointed that out. She must have been reading it. We figured it was just some, an update on myself. I figured it was an update on Gallagher of some sort. So it's probably a failure on my part for not reviewing the data correctly, but that's just want to point that out that maybe that's where other department heads are at. So, Joe, did you do you have a opinion one way or another about um, dissolving it? Well, I think, uh, you know, I've been here for a year and there was a lot of good discussion and helping me get up to speed on what proper procedures and how things take place, you know. Um, but I also agree that there's a lot of uh, talk in there um, and a lot of discussion that very well could be, I guess, uh, with a, uh, downsizing in numbers could be streamlined. But again, I, I've always taken the opinion that more heads are better than one, right? You get everybody's ideas, and as long as that still takes place, and John has said it's going to, um, I think it will be just fine. But um, I think the, the, the department, and not speaking for any of the other department heads, but the fear is that, uh, you know, that communication isn't going to take place. So um, as long as the communication is there, you know, and we have the discussions, I think we'll be fine. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Guffey. <laughs> my, my only concern is that it's a fair appeal process. I'm one of the departments that appealed a number of my positions. And you go right to Goldberg, Mr. Goldberg with Gallagher and 
and how he did it. He just looked at the job descriptions and rated them. And that's probably my, my bad for not having the, maybe an accurate job descriptions on my positions. But that was the appeal went to Mr. Goldberg and then understanding now, then it'll go to John. Well, you have one person, two person that you're appealing to and hopefully it's impartial, but you never know. They might, and I don't think yeah, John has a vendetta against me, but you never know in the future, you might have somebody that has hard feelings for you or your department and you're not getting a fair shake. That's that's my concern. And yeah, I think a 12 person committee is way too big, but you should have an appeal beyond just one person, in my opinion. So Mr. Guffey, can you not have that in the same, in a committee the same way? Oh can yeah, you, absolutely. You, and, and just as, like John said, it's yes. a popularity pr process too. I mean, you gotta have a fair and partial way. Right. But, uh, I'm just, I guess I'm biased towards my employees and I'm the best for them, so. And, and you're, and that's good. <laughs> Madam Chair. <laughs> Commissioner LaCroix. In light of what is discussion, I would make a motion to continue this to the next meeting to give us a chance to have discussions to have two options. Are you doing a, subs a substitute motion? Because there's a motion on the floor. Subs yeah, okay. substitute motion. I would second that, and I do have one more comment. Hold on just a sec. I didn't get the motion. Motion is to continue to the next meeting and come up with two options, have two options. Okay. And I second that. Motion by LaCroix, second by DeSanto. And my one comment is, is I hope that uh, that the not only the department heads, but the employees of Pennington County get to watch this so that they understand that we as commissioners are incredibly concerned about being fair and making sure that they're getting paid what they should be getting paid. Um, I think this is a great example, what's just gone on that says, we don't take these matters lightly. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Drews. Question for Commissioner LaCroix. I'm not sure I'm understanding what you're saying by come up with two options. Well, <clears throat> thanks, Gary, because option one is the one that we have right here in front of us. Option two or some other ones from departments that want to want to be able to bring them forward uh, would be a smaller group. Or maybe it goes to the department heads. I, I think uh, there's some, some discussion that could be done off the dais. Uh, good point with the, with the two options. Number one would be this, uh, commissioners could come forward with a second, uh, pretty much a second option to vote on. I would preferably to me, myself, uh, I'd like to see this option come up. I would more likely see like that the compensation committee at least be asked in their meeting and given the, the opportunity to give us an option of what they would like to see happen, whether it's a smaller group or where we go. But I don't think the compensation, when do, when do they meet next? Tomorrow? I would, that would be a good, good chance to get the second option was from them, rather than me. Mr. Drews? Um. No further questions. I'm, I'm going to vote against the substitute motion just because I think that, that the options already exist that they can bring it forward to the commission. Thank you. Um, I'm going to vote against the motion because um, you're taken back to a committee that we just heard about that you have 10 people, 15 people, and you have one guy. Um, what do you think those options are going to be? Um, there's a reason why we brought this forward just for that reason, emotions. Um, and that's what's going to be again. And you're not going to get a fair and biased off one guy off of 10 or 15 people. Um, again, he's trying to tell us something. Um, we can take it back to a committee. Um, we put this on the agenda for a reason. It was for professional reasons for him to do his job. Gallagher telling us the same thing. Some of the committees, um, they need to work with your HR guy, not a committee of 15 people deciding if uh, today um, Mark sounds good. Not that they do that, but in a sense also, we feel bad for each other because we are friends. We are friends in a committee. We're friends <laughs> when we're up here. And it's very hard to say something to someone when we really like them. So 
in that community, that's what that's going to happen. So um, I'm going to disagree with you. I'm, I'm going to agree to have the HR do his job, communicate like he's supposed to, and do like any other department head and not have a committee recommending what he should do. They should be suggesting um, bringing their motions and everything to him and not a committee and letting him decide if that's fair and just for Pennington County because he is our employee uh, guy that we trust. He is our HR guy. That's my bottom line. Um, you can take it to any committee you want, but you already know we just heard it today. Um, let's let's trust our guy and, and move this forward and uh, let him do his job. Thank you. Any other discussion? Well, I don't think two weeks is going to kill anybody. I think we need to continue it, listen to uh, a little more chance to listen. I'm not saying this isn't going to be my choice, but I I think uh, I'd like two more weeks to anybody wants to chime in. I want to be available to hear. Thank you. So we have a motion on the floor to continue for two weeks with bringing back two options. Um, Who's going to bring back the two options or write that down? What those two options are, or are we have in the HR write the two options that the committee is going to give that suggestion? What is the two options going to come from? I guess what I'd say is you have option one that's in front of us right now. If com compensation committees meet tomorrow, they give a, a, their recommendation. Okay. And then anything from the floor. Okay, thank you. So all in favor of the substitute motion, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. aye. Three ayes have it. Um, thank you for the good discussion today. <sighs> Number 20, which is funny, committee reports. <laughs> Commissioners, we need to decide on the presentation from Gallagher himself, uh, or from Mr. Goldberg himself. Oh. He has March 4th available to travel here to present the results of the wage study to you. So would you like to make that motion today so we can get those arrangements set? So let me ask you something. Does it go to the compensation committee first? All right, Deb. No, I wasn't being, <laughs> no, I wasn't being, I wasn't being mean. <laughs> So they're the recommending body, so doesn't it go to them? They make suggestions and bring it back to us because that's what you have right now. This is the Board of Commissioners schedule, not theirs. Yeah. Okay. This board needs to so make they, that decision, ma'am. So they will have a chance to weigh in on the in their compensation committee? They should hear at the same time you will at that meeting. Okay, so they're not hearing it differently. Not to my understanding. We'll have one presentation. Sorry. Sorry. John Morrill, Pennington County Human Resources. The presentation isn't ready. He's actually putting that together now, <clears throat> excuse me, based upon the data that they've gathered. So his first available date and the first date that he believed they would have everything ready for review is March 4th. Um, February, I had asked for dates sometime in February. He's unavailable and, and did not believe that his resources there would be able to get everything put together. So we have the, the data that you've seen already as, as a group as far as the individual ratings for different positions, we have that. They're fleshing out the costing model of implementation choices right now. Okay. Um, so we don't have that data. And, um, and I apologize, Holly. I just thought that you had told me at one time that it was going to compensation. So I thought maybe they the, were doing it tomorrow and then we were doing it second. That, that is what the, the comp committee would normally be tasked with, is reviewing all that, making recommendations to you as to what should be implemented and or changed. Okay. Uh, again, we won't have that opportunity basically because the information is not ready. Um, so I do know that there's 23 new jobs. Those were included in the ratings that were initially sent out. Um, I do have the data with regard to um, where each position is rated. And then we had to create this new position code, like I mentioned earlier, because office manager in one department isn't the same as it is in another. So there's department codes that identify the differences there. So you have 23 that we have created this year? That off are of brand new proposed positions. From they, Gallagher they or from been, our staff? They haven't, they, by staff, actually from all the departments, they've proposed the addition of 23 new positions that aren't currently on our scale. 
So these have then already had DBM ratings applied to them, but they don't currently exist. They would have to be approved as part of the review process as we move forward. So it would show what they're making now and, and how much it is a change on those 23 positions? They're brand new positions or brand new titles for positions that aren't currently on our scale. So for example, um, there's a... Um, There's a position in the highway department. Um, we took, so we had a retiree. I can explain how we got to the new position for the highway department. We had a person that retired in the wall division. We created a, a traveling mechanic, heavy mechanic, if you will, that supports a new Underwood and wall both. So because it's not traditionally just a mechanic assigned to a single shop, we created a heavy duty mechanic traveling mechanic. It's the same ratings, but it's a different position because of that travel requirement that goes into it. That's one of the new positions. So all 23 have ratings? They all have ratings under the DBM system. They do not have ratings under our current Condry system. They don't exist as our current system okay. stands today. So the 23 positions is a good thing to change because it works for Gallagher, or we're, we're reinventing the wheel again and, and no. starting over. No, I think we're correctly identifying yeah, the you. positions as they exist. And that was one thing that I, I think Joe mentioned earlier, but the job, or Scott did, Scott Duffy. Scott. The positions as they exist, the job descriptions aren't what they need to be. Correct. All the ratings we currently have are based upon the job descriptions that the departments were asked to update a year ago and submitted for review. There were some that did a really great job with that and others that didn't include all of the aspects of the job that probably need to be there. Part of our review process in Human Resources includes updating all those job descriptions and reviewing them annually to make sure they're current based upon technological changes or skills changes or requirements of the job. And then those get reevaluated based upon the value of the position as it exists with those new requirements. So the data we have currently is on the job descriptions as they exist today. That's part of the process in HR is reviewing those on a continual basis to make sure that they adequately and fairly reflect the value of those positions as they change. Madam Chair. Thank you. Commissioner uh, DeSanto. Please. One of the things that I saw in those in the differences was that there's a lot of positions that don't require a lot of continuing education, for example. Mm -hmm. um, now, it, it may be designated in our old way as the same exact designation as a position that could require 25 hours of of continuing education a year. And yet that continuing education wasn't taken into consideration in their wage. And so that's just one small little piece that, mm -hmm. that what John's talking about is by creating these new positions or these departments creating these new positions, I'm assuming that those new positions take into consideration each individual thing that is required in order to maintain um, a, competent, a competence level in that particular area. Yes, and to, to take that one step further, I guess, we have, um, in a couple of our departments, we have seasonal part-time help. They're basically administrative support. They file, they answer phones, they open mail. Uh, we've never called them anything other than seasonals. There's no description per se, it's just in our payroll system as seasonal. We actually are creating a job description and job title for those because they didn't exist before. They were being paid varying levels of money because there wasn't any pay grade or any job title for them. We have some that are making substantial amounts and others that aren't being paid quite as well, but we're making that standard as well. So there is actually an admin support job title now moving forward with the new Gallagher study. Uh, that's just, <clears throat> excuse me, another example of one that, that is being created to help alleviate something that was missing. Thank you, John. Yep. Um, so so I would make a motion that we have the Gallagher study uh, on March 4th. Second. Any dis other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries. Next is committee reports. I have none. I don't think any of us. I have none. Jerry. None for me. Lloyd. <coughs> I attended uh, the fair board. And as Ron gave his presentation, I don't need to go any further from that. The only thing I would add is much had created uh, an application form 
for board members to be nominated and so forth. So there's a new nomination uh, form that they'll they'll be using, which is very easy to be able to know who nominated them, and give a little description about it. So uh, for for when um, the seats come open, there'll be a form of available to be able to fill out. Um, I attended the National Forest Board meeting. I sent out an email a while back that on um, some exploratory mining uh, public hearings that they're going to have that at last Thursday. I, I didn't was not able to attend, but we'll be getting a report uh, next month of that meeting. Once I get that report, I can give that report back to the commission uh, and give you a little heads up of how many people attended and so forth on that. Um, I did attend the Safety Justice MacArthur uh, meeting this week or last week, and that's moving forward and looking good. And there's nothing to really to report this time. I did attend the inaugural youth uh, city council meeting uh, last week, and I have to admit that was very amazing. Uh, I think there was. 12 or 18 youths that started the youth on the youth council. It was just an election of the, the officers and kind of getting to know what was going on. One of the things I did find amazing was that they did the ballot vote for their for their uh, election of their uh, officers. Uh, and so I thought that was uh, need to watch that that's how it went there's no discussion on it but uh, it's very amazing because the youth council was something that was talked about 12 years ago uh, when ACE had started up and then which in turn turned into teen up uh, in our community and it was the youth who brought it forward uh, as they said it was uh, three different times they've tried to form a, a youth council in our community and and this time uh, the stars aligned and the city council members and the leadership uh, seen the wealth of, of hearing their voices. Uh, it's very young. It's, you know, they're still learning the structure part of the meetings. It was just the first meeting, but I have the feeling that uh, uh, it's going to move forward in amazing ways and being able to uh, get some of the input back from uh, the youth in our community of what they can do for us. So... Uh, that's all I have to report for this week. Thank you. And we do have new uh, liaison assignments, so you know um, everybody has those. Uh, we tried to give everybody, me, Holly, and Gary tried to give everybody some of the stuff they they picked first and second. And um, then through that, we tried to do it with your timing and in Ron's case where he lived because, you know, coming in that far. So we try to be fair and just on that, and hopefully everybody is, is good with that. Um, and thank you for putting in your papers to Ms. Holly and Ms. Joan. Next is the 2020 legislative session. Gary, please. I would ask Scott uh, Guffey to come forward. Uh, <coughs> we've talked by, by email over the Senate Bill 24, and I have talked to the County Association and here on it. They're looking for input, so I'm interested to hear what you have to say. Well, great. This is Scott Guffey, Fankton County Natural Resources Director. Yeah, Senate Bill 24, um, Department of Ag kind of didn't consult with anybody on this. It, it has to do with the pesticide registration fees, which is anything that has an EPA number, has to register in the state, and there's a fee associated with that. Well, currently there's... Uh, I just took a picture of this so I could remember. Um, there's the weed and pest fund that comes out of that, which funds our grants that most of the counties get. Actually, uh, the way they do it now, if you meet all these criteria called a participation grant, you get like $5,000 each county does if they have like a weed and pest department, a supervisor attend certain meetings and trainings and stuff. And then there's uh, competition grants, competitive grants that we, we apply for every year and do quite well in. And then School of Public Lands gets money for treating weeds and pests on their lands. And then there's the Pesticide Regulatory Fund, Pesticide Re Recycling Fund, SDSU Ex Egg Experiment Station, 
and then SDSU cooperative extension that gets all funding out this fund or this fee. And in the past, I've been part part of uh, working groups that have gone in and looked at this fee, and we asked all the participants, "Do you need a bump in that in that fee?" Uh, and a lot of times, we look at the surrounding states and see what they're charging. And normally, South Dakota is low, so we can we bump it up to try to match or get close to what the surrounding states are. And it's I think it's been about eight years since we've opened that fund up. And this past fall at the South Dakota Weed and Pest Commission meeting in Rapid here, they actually discussed that because their grant fundings are going down the amount of dollars they have because there was a surplus. That surplus has been spent down and now they, this year they have $200,000 less than what they've had previously to grant out to the counties. So the county's going to fill it there. And then uh, also they're looking to add on to the uh, um, a commercial applicator fee. So anybody that comes to work for us, you have, have to get a commercial applicator fee. Well, in the past, it's government employees have been fee exempt. Now they're going to add a $35 fee on top of that. So every two years, you know, normally we have about 10 applicators and we pay that for them. That's going to be, you know, $175 a year that we're going to have to pay now to the state for this. So they're kind of double dipping there. They're doubling the amount that they're getting off that pesticide registration fee on two accounts, um, both the uh, recycling fee and the uh, um, reg regulatory fee. So they're going from $20 up to $40 on both both of those fee accounts. So they're bumping that. The current registration fee is 120. It's gonna bump up to 160. Well, they're doubling what they're getting, yet the rest of the people that get that funding aren't getting any increase. And they didn't ask us. I mean, we brought that up and the State Department of Ag said, yeah, we'll look into it uh, and then uh, we'll move forward. And then just two weeks ago, the, the, there was a subcommittee of the Weed and Pest Commission that looked at the grants to, to vote on them. There's somebody from the Department of Ag there and, they brought that up and they said, yeah, no, we're not looking at opening up that fee. A week later, they come out with a Senate Bill 24. So they really kind of did a dirty on the Weed and Pest Commission. And the, uh, South, the chairman of the South Dakota Weed and Pest Commission called me last week and he was, he was pretty hot about it. And he's definitely gonna go down and testify. And I'm planning on too. And in the past, I've registered. I just wanna make sure that it's okay if I register either on behalf of the Pennington County Weed and Pest or the weed and pest board, but uh, I would like to go down and testify on that. Yeah, Council sure. limit, and if Gary can go down too, or uh, Scott, has there been any fees that you've had to pay as the county had to pay previously? Well, on the uh, on the applicator's fee, um, you have to pay. Uh, so I have a dealer's license because we sell the uh, poison oats. So every two years, that's fifty dollars that I have okay. to pay. But uh, and then. Every two years, you have to go and recertify, and they've bumped that up in the past. I think it was only like 20 bucks. Now it's $50 each time you send a person to recertification. So that, I don't know where that money go, is going. Supposedly it's going to SDSU. But now this is a completely new fee on, on uh, paying for the government agencies. So, so. I think this goes back, for me, this goes back to one government entity charging yeah. another government entity. Right. Just doesn't make sense. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, if you would, uh, also, um, uh, put your thoughts down in writing, mm -hmm. I'd like to forward that on to, uh, our lobbyists yeah. so they can be working that in advance too. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll do like a one page or that. Yep. I appreciate that. that. Scott. So. Commissioner Drews, or DeSanto. So these, these fees that they're collecting aren't going into a pool and then being dispersed back out to weed and pest and no. those types of departments. No, I mean... So when they collect that fee for somebody registering a product in the state, it currently is 120, and then from that 120, it's divvied out to those different funds that I mentioned. So the, the proposed increase, like I said, the pesticide regulatory and recycling is doubling what their amount is, but the rest, the rest of the people that are getting a fund, they're not getting an increase I at see. all. I see, okay. So it would've been nice if they would've consulted with those other people that are getting part of that fund to see if they need an increase and open open it one time instead of, well, you guys can go back next year. Well, you know how that goes. And yeah. you go, well, then we just open this up. We don't want to bump that again, so. so we can make a resolution, Gary, is that okay. what you're thinking, um, to yes. support um, Mr. Guffey when he goes there? Yes. And well, do we have him? I think, no. I think we do it. 
We just need a motion of opposition yeah, to Senate opposition Bill 24 Senate and Bill 24. direct Scott to okay. do his comments that can be used. Okay. Does it, oh. Don't you have to be a member to, meaning you have to pay a fee to speak even I've there? A lobbyist fee if you want to speak on behalf of an entity. Otherwise, I can go speak on behalf of okay. an individual. Okay. But it carries a lot more clout if, you, if you're registered. Okay. Okay. I would make that motion that uh, we send Scott to... Uh, Speak against Senate Bill 24. Okay. Second. In Motion by DeSanto, second by Rosconnect to move to take a position of opposition SB 24 with Scott Guffey. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Thank Scott. Thanks, Any other Scott. update, Gary, that you'd uh, like to update us with? There really isn't at this point in time. I, I have been in contact with the County Association. Uh, we specifically talked about Senate Bill 24. Um, that's the only legislation right now that uh, has a concern of counties. So, thank you. Mayor. Item 22, if you would, Gary, um, I have to abstain. I will. I will. I will make. Uh, a, Madam Chair, I got oh. a comment on. Oh, sorry, <laughs> Commissioner Decroy. I I just wanted to make the comment that I think Gary's doing a good job on that. And I, we got a letter from Cindy Heidenberger. The president, uh, we've had a couple of them now, another one last week, wasn't it? And the best way to communicate with our legislators is ourselves doing emails and so forth. Relying one person on on doing the work uh, is only one voice, but if we all continue to get those emails and send those in, it means it's more impactful. And, and Cindy sees that and, and recommends that. Yeah. And I think we should be mindful of the Cracker Barrel sessions that they yeah. have here and attend those on a regular basis too. So, okay, uh, item 22, and this is uh, vouchers. Uh, need a motion to approve the vouchers in the amount of uh, $3,760,207.25. Motion Chairman Hadcock is going to abstain on this. And she just abstained from that one. From the price LLC. Okay. Move for approval. Second. Got a motion and a second. Uh, further discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, Commissioner Hadcock uh, abstained from the vote uh, to the price motel. Thank you. <sighs> items number 23 is items from the public. Public? I think we uh, <laughs> warm out. <laughs> Item 24 is executive session personnel issue SDCL 1 25 2 1. So move. Second move by Drew. Second by LaCroix. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Move to come out of executive session. So moved. Exactly. 
All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved by Drews. Second. Second by LaCroix. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries.